Today's is a Bloomington City Council Common Council meeting, regular session, uh, Wednesday, February the 3rd, 2021. And we're starting just after 6.30 p.m. Um, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Rollo? Here. Volan? Here. Rosenbarger? Here. Scambolori? Here. Sims? Here. Flaherty? Here. Piedmont Smith? Here. Smith? Here. And Sandberg? Here. All right, thanks everyone for being here this evening. Um, the agenda summation for this evening is first, we'll have approval of minutes. Then we'll have reports. Um, I'll remind everyone that these are a maximum of 20 minutes set aside for each section. So we'll have reports from council members, um, if any. Reports from the mayor and city offices, if any. We'll have reports from council committees, if any. And then we'll have comments from the public. Then we'll move on to appointments to boards and commissions. We have legislation this evening for second readings and resolutions. The first will be resolution 2104, which is the approval of an interlocal cooperation agreement between the city of Bloomington and Monroe County, Indiana regarding building code authority. The next item would be resolution 21-05, the preliminary approval of to issue economic development revenue bonds and lend the proceeds of the, of the renovation for affordable housing regarding Crestmont Community 1007 Summit Street, Bloomington, RAD 2, LP Petitioner. The next item is Ordinance 21-04. This is to amend Title Eight of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Historic Preservation and Protection to establish a historic district regarding the core building historic district. The next item will be ordinance 21-05 to amend title eight of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled his historic preservation and protection to establish a historic district regarding the Boxman Mitchell building historic district. The last item for second readings would be ordinance 2103, which was formerly 20-33, to amend Title II of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Administration and Personnel regarding Chapter 2.02, .02, Boards and Commissions Revised, and Chapter 2.04, Common Council Revised. We have one item for first readings this evening. That is ordinance 21-02 to rezone a 10.10.097 acre property from plan unit development to mixed use corridor regarding the Bill C. Brown revocable trust petitioner. Then we'll move on to additional public comment. Um, I think at this point in time, and I will remind um, our public that at the first public comment, we have a time limit of 20 minutes. And on the second public comment, um, which is toward the end of the agenda, there's a maximum time of 25 minutes set aside for this section. Um, I would also like to remind the, uh, the public, and I wanna thank Council Member Piedmont Smith for um, um, making sure that we got to this this evening. I just wanna remind everyone that if you're on the same computer or phone, um, during Zoom when there's public comment, if there's more than one person, could you please let us know so that we can attempt um, to do all we can so that everyone is heard. Um, and we'll speak more about that when that time comes. Then we'll move on to council to matters regarding council schedule, and then we'll move on to adjournment. Our, do we have minutes to approve? Mr. President, I move that the minutes for the regular sessions of March 23rd, 2005, September 21st, 2005, November 2nd, 2005, June 7th, 2006, June 21st, 2006, and July 5th, 2006 be approved. Second. 
Thank you. It's been moved and second. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Rallo? Yes. Volan? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Scandaler? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Sandberg? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That motion passes nine to zero. Uh, now we'll move on to reports, um, starting first with council members. Um, starting uh, to my left from as I see you on the screen, council member Sandberg. Thank you. I did want to say a few words on the passing of Keith Klein, which I'm sure came as, as quite a shock for many of us. And many of us have so many memories of him as a, a real community leader. Um, my memories of him go back to our time on the Bloomington Pops board and um, especially when that uh, moved out to the grounds of Ivy Tech. And he was such a, a, a good um, member of that team and, and uh, served as our MC for many of the concerts. But uh, in today's paper, of course, I see that the uh, School Foundation, MCCSC, is setting up a memorial fund for him. He was such a big uh, pr uh, advocate for broadcast journalism, and it is appropriate that this fund will be uh, going toward um, uh, television programs um, in, in schools such as Bachelor's Wonderful Program. And what a wonderful way to honor his, his legacy of being such a great broadcast journalist in our community and uh, also a member of the MCCS school board. So again, did not want this evening to pass without um, expressing my gratitude for his community service. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Councilmember Rallo. I have no report, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Flaherty. No report this evening, thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Smith. I have no report this evening. Thank you. Councilmember Volan. Yes, uh, I did want to say a few words. First of all, I'd like to echo uh, Councilmember Sandberg's uh, sentiments on Keith Klein. He was a good man who served this community uh, faithfully for decades and uh, his, his contrib many contributions will be missed. Um, I also wanted to reminisce a little bit in looking at through the minutes we just approved from 2005, 2006, uh, quite a momentous time in the city council's uh, history a couple of the items that were in those minutes include the approval of the living wage ordinance, which was a, a real sea change uh, in the way that uh, the city did business. Uh, it was a big issue in the 2003 uh, campaign, which I know um, several members who are on council now took part in, um, and, but uh, it didn't pass to 2005. And, uh, you know, there was some dispute about whether it would be uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, the obligation to everyone in the city to follow, and it wasn't, it was just uh, to city government, but it still uh, shapes the way that, um, that the city looks at uh, how it employs people. Um, and I'm glad that uh, I was there for it. Uh, also, um, another set of minutes uh, celebrated the uh, appointments, uh, the initial appointments to the uh, Bloomington Sustainability Commission, which was, uh, approved on the heels of uh, the sustainability ordinance, Councilman Varallo uh, uh, sponsored and developed. Um, and among other initial members of the commission were our current mayor, John Hamilton of the first commission. So it's very interesting reading to look through um, uh, of those minutes. Also uh, sometime I'm looking forward to exploring uh, amendment one to resolution 0518 uh, anybody who's interested in talking about that, go back and look at the minutes and uh, uh, see if they don't want to talk about it sometime with me. Thanks very much for uh, the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Council Member Scambellari. Yes, thank you. Um, two quick things. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge um, 
Keith Klein's passing and acknowledge in particular, uh, I host my family for Thanksgiving every year, my extended family, and he has great fans in them. Uh, they saw him every canopy of lights introducing the tuba Santas and serving as MC. Um, so, so his, his reputation as an iconic community figure uh, goes well beyond Bloomington. So I wanted to acknowledge that as well. Uh, I also want to extend an invitation this coming Saturday, February 6th, will be my February constituent meeting to be held at 1.30, still currently via Zoom due to COVID precautions. Um, if you go to my website, sueforcitycouncil.com, uh, you'll see a link there where a button you could click on just to join from right from there. Um, our guest, uh, this month from the city will be Lou May from Bloomington Transit. Um, we also will have some guests from Elm Heights um, join us and talk about a survey that they are doing right now uh, related to zoning and they want an opportunity to share that with other neighborhoods as well. So that's coming up Saturday. And again, SueForCityCouncil.com has the button that'll let you join. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council Member Rosenbarger. No report tonight, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Piedmont Smith. <clears throat> yes, um, I'd like to mention um, that I also will have a constituent meeting coming up. It's not this Saturday, but the following Saturday, February 13th um, at 11 a.m. And there is a link um, from my uh, page on the City Council on the City website and also uh, on Facebook from um, the uh, Isabel Piedmont for City Council page. So if you search for that you'll you'll find the link um, it's uh, on February 13th we always uh, have a chance to talk about what constituents want to talk about uh, but I'm sure that um, we'll also be addressing um, at least in brief some of the uh, issues at the top of people's minds uh, homelessness as well as uh, the UDO changes to zoning so hope to see some of you there thank you thank you very much um, if I may, I would just like to piggyback on the sentiments for um, our friend Keith Klein. Um, he had quite the bio, and uh, many of my colleagues spoke on many of those endeavors um, during their comments. Um, Keith was a friend of mine, um, as he was for many of us in the community. Um, Keith, if I think many of you know, maybe many of you didn't, was from Gary, Indiana. Um, he used to speak highly and often about Northwest Indiana, as him and I would talk. Um, and, and I always found that fondly. Um, I think many also know that Keith was a high school referee, athletic referee um, in football, and I do believe basketball. Um, and I want to say close to maybe 40 years um, that, that he, he did that. Um, he also was very, very strong in the Demolé, his organization um, that he traveled around the world with. Um, he also was a fellow Rotarian, and we all took great pride in being uh, part of Rotary with Keith. And finally, I always like to think of, of real happy times. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a spot on WGCL with him and Mike Glass, um, sometimes in Glass in the morning. Um, and sometimes I'd be fortunate enough to get maybe four minutes. And sometimes um, if we had a schedule break, we might even go eight or 10 minutes. Um, but to talk about some of the city council um, activities and some of the things that we were doing, um, an opportunity to share with him and our listeners what we were doing and um, how dedicated I think our colleagues are was a pleasure for me and I will miss that. So thank you all for those comments. Um, moving on to reports, do we have anyone here from the mayor or city offices? Okay, seeing none, do we have any reports for, from council committees this evening? Okay, again, seeing none, we'll now go to public comment. Um, and I will remind everyone that this period is set aside for 20 minutes. Um, I will also remind us again that if in fact we do have public comment and there's more than one person on the same 
computer or Zoom link or phone, please let us know that. Um, we'll just do the very best we can to accommodate all who would like to comment. So thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lucas, do we have any takers? Yes, I see a few hands raised and for uh, uh, members of the I'm public. So, who, oh, no, uh, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I, for, I forgot about the raised hand function in Zoom or send us a chat message um, if you uh, would like to be recognized. Um, one more time, if you want to speak, just use a raised hand function in Zoom or send us a message on chat. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. I do see a few hands raised and I know I've gotten at least one message over the chat. Um, uh, I'm not sure if the chair wants to uh, specify how long folks will have. Um, at the moment, I see three hands raised and, and one chat message. Okay, I now see four hands, five hands. Um, and you say you have one chat message? As of right now. Um, five, six, seven. Um, okay, eight, seven, eight, nine. Um, we'll go three minutes per speaker to try to meet our time limit. Uh, two, two chat messages and I see uh, seven hands raised at the moment. Um, and first up, I believe I saw Alex Goodlad's hand raised and Alex should be ready to comment now. Are you ready, Mr. Goodlad? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready now. Do you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you please identify yourself, please? Okay, yeah. Uh, so my name is Alex uh, Goodlad, last name G-O-O-D-L-A-D. And um, so I just want to, you know, uh, talk about concerns of uh, homeless individuals. And, uh, and, and, and before I get to concerns about homeless individuals, I want to address concerns that were brought upon about myself. Um, I received some emails from, uh, you know, IU people saying that I should uh, seek help for whatever reason. Um, I didn't ask for it, but you know, I'm, I'm glad that uh, people are concerned about, you know, my well-being. And uh, yeah, my family's kind of concerned about it too. And, uh, and, I, I, and I feel like we should be concerned about the homeless individual's well-being. So uh, what, and what I told my parents was, um, you know, I'll figure out how in the w hell that I'm going to do, you know, research at this time. But, um, but, but things that are going on in the city, I, I, I cannot even tell them during that conversation I had with them. And I'm about to tell you what I wasn't able to tell my family because it's just so crazy. So currently there have been some positive cases in the uh, homeless community. And, you know, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to, you know, raise tensions or anything. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, but like, I don't want to, but Wheeler Mission has 17 positive cases of COVID. That, that is, you know, there, there's, there's a source to verify it and uh, that'll be, in the future that will be verified, but that is what I received reports of and someone I talked to personally while giving a ride has said that um, they, that Shalom is not accepting people from Wheeler for that reason. And, um, and, and, and then, and then another person I talked to, you know, said the same thing. So th this is, you know, slowly but surely it's going to come out and, uh, and, and before I, you know, yell at you guys every day on the phone, because I guess that's what's going to happen. Um, we, 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 the, the city really needs to do, you know, two things. And I guess I, I know you're the city council and I'm, I'm really talking to the city. I, I hope that Andrew Krebs and, uh, you know, um, and Carmichael's on and the, the, those people that are PRing and shilling for the city hey, right now. Mr. I hope they're listening. Mr. Um, Mr. Goodlatte, can you finish yeah? up, please? Thank you. Sure. Um, so one, uh, we, we, we gotta get them quarantined at hotels immediately. That's something that the city can do. That's something that they, they have to do, uh, legally speaking, they, they, they have these folks got to get quarantined too. Um, they got us, they, um, Mr. Goodlatte, 
Alex, and, and you got to keep them warm too. And that's my time. Sorry. Thank you. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next up, I have a message and, from. Okay, and this time, I'm sorry, before you speak, I do want to remind all our public commenters that these are for items not on tonight's agenda. So thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Lucas. Next up, I have a comment that Dave Stewart submitted over chat. Uh, Dave says, um, uh, doesn't have a microphone, so he'd like me to read his comment. Uh, Dave says, my opinion is that owner-occupied ADUs or owner-occupied duplexes are acceptable, uh, but to open the core neighborhoods to absentee duplexes is not acceptable. Uh, his key point is that any multiplex in the core neighborhood should be owner-occupied uh, akin to an ADU. Thank you. And the next speaker we have, I believe, is Chaz uh, Modinger, who should now be able to unmute. Hi, um, Chaz Modinger. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for hearing me out. I want to also address the UDO. Um, a little background. I'm a 30-year-old who went to IU and stayed in Bloomington because I love it here so much. My partner is a county. So um, between that, we know a lot of people. I'm a photographer here in town. And talking about the UDO, I know it's such a heated argument um, on both sides, and I totally understand why. It's a huge major deal. So as maybe a young voice, I do want to say that I hope that the UDO can be paused and we can rethink about this and come up with better compromises later. I don't think that there's a lot of protections yet that, that will say that it'll actually do what it's supposed to do. Density is a real problem and affordable housing is such a real problem. And these are major, major issues that we really need to be putting all, we need to be listening to both sides and we really need to be finding better compromises. And I think we just need to listen to each other a little more as well. So I really want to plead with you all to say, when you think about the UDO, just let's pause it and let's rethink this and let's move forward to find some better solutions and better compromises. Um, density is a real problem, but just getting rid of a bunch of buildings is a real problem too. And I know, I just think both sides, yeah, they're very heated and I understand where both sides are coming from, but I just think the best thing to do, especially in the middle of a pandemic, would be to pause this and rethink it and try to find the best solution. So Bloomington could be a leader in how to do this right and not just do it quickly and push something that we're not sure is gonna work or just push something because, you know, we think it looks good. I feel like I'm a progressive person and I just worry that we're, we don't have enough protections to actually have the UDO do as it's gonna say. You know, I worry about developers. We're, we've been trying to buy a house and you know, it Ms. is- Ms. Mottinger, I'm sorry, you have about 10 seconds. So basically, I just wanna say, I hope this thing could be paused and I hope we can come back to it at a different time when we have more compromises and solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have a uh, screen name SFE0722, who should now be able to unmute. Hi, can you identify yourself? You have about three minutes, or you have three minutes. Certainly. I'm Russ Skiba. Um, I'm past president of the Planning and Development Group of Quality Growth and an IU professor emeritus. I'm speaking on the amendment to Bloomington's UDO. Unfortunately, the community discussion on upzoning has been marred by insinuations, both in letters to the Herald Times and in a blog on, uh, on the pro upzoning website, that those who oppose upzoning are racist. One cannot help but agree with the respondent who called that a cheap shot that does nothing to help find solutions to the problem of affordable housing in Bloomington. But racism is a fact of our history and embedded deeply in our institutions today. Like many of the remnants of racism, today's pattern of housing segregation weren't accidental. Richard Rothstein has written that segregation was in fact intentional, created by bankers, planners, realtors, fearful and biased white residents, and perhaps most importantly, through the actions of the federal government. One of the first statutes to limit housing by race was developed by realtors in Baltimore in 1911. Yet I haven't heard anyone proclaiming that realtors need to stop being racist. Mortgage lenders made powerful contributions to redlining, refusing loans to blacks 
who wish to buy in white neighborhoods, yet so far I'm unaware of any calls to eliminate mortgage lending. So I find it more than a little odd that proponents of this change call for the elimination of single family zoning and point the finger of racism squarely at homeowners who oppose upzoning. The planning department claims that increased density will help us meet the equity and affordability goals of the comprehensive plan. But everywhere else it's been tried, upzoning has led to increased property values, higher rents, and the displacement of lower income residents and residents of color. In fact, it's those residents who upzoning supposedly helps, who have most often been the victims of upzoning and its most vocal opponents. The LA Tenants Union has called strategies like upzoning, quote, a dangerous ideology that is funded by the powerful to serve the powerful. We aren't at fault for the mistakes of history, but we are responsible for undoing its legacy, the legacy of those mistakes. So let's stop pointing fingers and together begin a serious community-wide initiative to increase equity and affordability. We can examine Bloomington's history with clear eyes and vow to right the wrongs we discover. We can convene community forums to explore strategies with a proven track record to promote affordable housing and equity. We can encourage MCCSZ to examine the serious issues of racial and economic segregation in Bloomington schools and support redistricting. It's up to us. We can choose a divisive fight with lots of point finger pointing and epithets, or we can pause this process, slow down, and together make our way towards constructive and anti-racist solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skiba. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next up is Barbara Moss. Should now be ready to comment. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, can you identify you. yourself and you have three yes. minutes? Yes, I'm Barbara Moss, and I'm also talking about the um, density issue, the upzoning issue. This is gonna sound a little strange perhaps, but I wanna share that every week I meet my friend Helen at her downtown ADR created duplex apartment. And in summers we take walks around to see what's in bloom in the fantastic garden that they have. People stop out front to admire it and chat, even in these dog days of COVID. My friend loves the place and plans to spend her retirement in this duplex. And since her occupancy is long-term, expensive annual repairs and repainting that come with transients are unnecessary. So her rent is able to be extremely reasonable. This is the way many of us envision duplex conversion in Bloomington, as strengthening the fabric of our communities, especially in the core neighborhoods. And current Bloomington zoning already wisely provides this option. However, I fear that changing zoning to allow for unrestrained duplex development beyond the ADR model will have the opposite effect. The ability to convert a single stream of rent revenue to as many as six streams in a single non-owner occupied duplex will likely be irresistible to capital rich national real estate investors. They can easily outbid locals for Bloomington's dwindling supply of smaller single family homes, transforming whole neighborhoods into transient rent by the bedroom conversions. We know it's already happened in other Midwestern cities. Older houses in Bloomington's core neighborhoods provide some of the lowest rental pricing in Bloomington. There is no cheaper housing to replace it. Concern about zoning duplexes has perhaps fallen under the radar with focus on seemingly more alarming tri and quadplexes, but unrestricted duplex zoning is really far from innocuous. It's a significant danger to core neighborhoods. I am simply asking you all to very carefully consider all of this in your upcoming upzoning deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. What do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next up, we have uh, Tina Honeycutt, who should be ready to comment. Um, good evening. I wanted to... Can you identify yourself, Ms. Honeycutt, please? I'm sorry, you have three minutes. Yes, this is Tina Honeycutt. And I want to bring up again the fact that our 
unhoused population is about to be hit with a really huge cold spell this weekend. And um, we're still not doing what needs to be done as a city. I am disturbed that I saw the city is considering maybe having a warming station. However, they need an organization to step up to, to staff it. Um, this over-reliance on charities and, and only social service organizations to staff and to take care of our neighbors that are unhoused is not acceptable. We need to do something. And I'm going to keep coming and keep saying this. And I know that there, have, there are things that are being done to try and, and get this moved forward. But as you were talking at the beginning of the meeting, we have six more weeks of winter. There isn't time to be continuing to try to do something, do something. You'll notice that Indianapolis is doing something, that many other cities are doing something and are actually funding um, hotels for homeless and not expecting do something. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, Mr. Lucas, by that count, that uh, was seven or eight. Is that what you have? Seven. And okay, now my point is we're approaching the, the end of comment period. Um, I want to check with Mr. Parliamentarian. How many do we have left, Mr. Lucas, remaining? After, after we got started, I thought I had 10 counted. I, I've got about 11 more folks that would like to comment. Um, Mr. President, Mr. Could, I, yes. could I make a motion to extend public comment for 11 more minutes and we could allow each participant a minute each? Second. Yes, I need a second. Thank you. Uh, it's been motion and second. Um, uh, Mr. Parliamentarian, is this something we have to call the roll on? Uh, yes. Yes. Will the clerk please call the roll? I don't know if Mr. Lucas had something to weigh in with. Oh, I will note that there is an additional period of public comment toward the end of yes. the, uh, later on in the agenda. Um, I'd also suggest that um, council members consider giving each member of the public an equal amount of time, um, whether that's during this period or, or the later period. Council Member Rollo. I would simply note that that's several hours away. And, you know, I think public comment is important. And if we could accommodate people now, uh, perhaps, you know, a minute isn't very long, but it's enough to make a point. And, it, and you know, they have to be concise. But we will, we will see what the sentiment of the council is. So, um, Okay, Council Member Piedmont Smith. I don't know whether this motion is debatable, but I would propose at least two minutes. In one minute, you really can't say much at all. I'll accept that as a friendly um, amendment to my motion. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lucas, please make note on the next number that you have, um, and that's where we'll cut it off um, should this motion pass. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Sorry, I'm point sorry. of order. Yes. Um, if if the motion is restated is for two minutes, the time limit um, uh, mentioned should also be extended if the idea is to accommodate everyone with their hand currently raised. Uh, so if Mr. Rallo is interested in restating a motion uh, to call for two minutes and enough time for the, oh, is it 11 participants, Mr. Lucas? I think that would be uh, in order. Is that correct, Mr. Lucas? It was it was eleven. Although I think uh, I've seen some hands go up and down, so uh, it's uh, changing as we speak. Well, let's keep it at eleven, and that would mean twenty-two minutes. So the motion is to have eleven participants uh, use uh, two minutes uh, each for a total of twenty-two minutes of extended public comment. Second. 
Second. Hey, looking at our parliamentarian's hand, seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? One moment, please. I'm just capturing the motion. Okay, council member, um, Councilmember Volan? No. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Edmund Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. You're extending the um and Rollo? Yes. We're extending the comment period, the public comment period. I already spoke. Yeah. Can you please mute? Okay. Was that complete, Madam Clerk? Yes, it was. Okay. Thank you. And that motion passes eight to one. Uh, Mr. Lucas, can we please Next proceed? Up. And we have just the next 11 people. Next up, we have uh, RM who should be ready to comment. Good evening. Thank you uh, for uh, allowing us to speak. Um, can, can you identify yourself, Ms. Miller, and you have um, two minutes. Sure, um, and it's uh, she, they are my pronouns. Um, Thank Renee, you. It's Renee Miller. Um, I'm concerned about the COVID cases in um, all the shelters, but primarily the Wielder shelter because there is a a large outbreak in that shelter. Um, I think what would work is when we have a positive case in a shelter that we ask the people that are testing positive to isolate. We have an isolation shelter and if, if and when that becomes full, uh, the city has the ability to uh, use funds that are being um, given by FEMA to get more hotel rooms. So I would suggest that um, everyone look into that right away because all of these people are coming into our community. They can't go to Shalom now, they're being turned away. And because they're being turned away, they're going elsewhere. Um, and, and rightly so, they're being turned away because we're protecting the people that are at Shalom now from being, um, uh, from getting sick also. Um, so. But having said that, um, that's that's what needs to be done. You can do it. I know it can be done. Um, and on another note, um, who was it that was talking about what other cities are doing? Because they're just everywhere now. And this city is not doing anything. Um, saying that you're making suggestions is not actually doing something yourself and relying on social service organizations to do everything when you could be doing something yourselves and you just keep passing the buck, passing the buck, passing the buck. And it's, and, and it's just, it's really sad. It's sad. And then you open the meeting talking about um, a groundhog and you don't even hear yourselves talking about a groundhog in winter because you're all sitting in your nice warm I'm, homes. I'm sorry, Renee, your time is up. 10 seconds. You're sitting in your nice warm homes, but we have over 120 people that are outside right now, freezing. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Who's Thank next, you. Mr. Lucas? Thank you. Next up is uh, Wendy Bernstein, who should now be ready to comment. Hi, it's actually Ed Bernstein, but that's okay. I'll keep this quick. I'm, I'm just kind of echoing this eloquently, Chaz. Given COVID and the fact that we're doing all this on Zoom, I do not see the rush to, uh, you know, uh, approve this upzoning. I think we have to step back. As Tommy Allison said, maybe we all get all the participants around a big table and talk about this. I don't see any reason that this thing is being rushed given the circumstances that we are all facing now, particularly as this woman just ta talked about with COVID and the variant 
um, it's, it, it makes no sense. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Who's next, Mr. Lucas? Next up, we have Stephen Sibley. Hi. Hi, hi Stephen, you have two minutes. Hi, I'm uh, Stephen Sibley. I um, just wanted to share my experience. Uh, um, a finance professor in the Kelly School of Business. Um, three years ago when I was on the job market trying to determine where I would uh, relocate to, to with my, my young family, um, you know, one of the things that, that struck out about Bloomington and that was ultimately a deciding factor is that, you know, I could live affordably in a relatively large sized house within walking or bicycling distance to my office. Um, you know, other universities that I looked at uh, many of which had already gone through the upzoning and had the duplexes and the triplexes move into the old historic neighborhoods. Um, you know, the, the houses that were remaining were prohibitively expensive. Um, and so, you know, largely I, I, my family relocated to Bloomington um, because of the neighborhoods and because of the strength of those neighborhoods. And, and it, it has taken, you know, decades and decades um, for these neighborhoods to develop the character that they have. And I would just hate for this UDO to be to be passed, it takes, you know, it would take a year to tear it all down, right? So I mean, the, the, the amount of time that that uh, it has taken for Bloomington to develop this this unique character that, that, give, that makes Bloomington special and what it is, you know, it's very easy to tear that down. Um, just ask private equity investors to come in and, and, and they can bulldoze all the old uh, buildings and to completely destroy the character of the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, and young folks like myself looking to move in, we'll, we'll, we'll choose elsewhere. Um, so I would, you know, it's very, um, you know, echoing uh, Chaz and Ed, you know, there's, I just don't understand the rush on, on passing this and that, that especially in a pandemic, um, you know, it, it just seems like we could spend some more time and Ed suggested sit around a table talking about this rather than looking at each other over computer screens. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next up is Ann Connors. We should be able to unmute. Are you there, Ann? Are you there, Ann? Okay, maybe we can go to the next, Mr. Lucas, and come back for her if she gets born. Uh, next up, we have Anna Kane, who should be able to unmute. Hi there. Help, My name is. Help. Go ahead, I'm sorry, you have two minutes. That's all right, thank you. Um, my name is Annalise Kane. I'm a graduate student at IU, and I wanted to second Tina Honeycutt's uh, point. Um, the city has the resources to house the homeless in ho hotels, and it's irresponsible to rely on service organizations to keep working this out amongst themselves. It's really a matter of life and death to house these people, and I'd like to call on you to step up and to look out for those who are most vulnerable in your city. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. What do we have next, Mr. Lucas? I believe I saw Ann Connors uh, unmute herself right at the end there. So Ann Connors should be up next. Hello, I grew up in Bloomington. Hi, this hi, year. hi Ann, can you identify yourself? And you have two minutes, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, that's okay. Ann Connors. Um, I grew up in Bloomington on the east side. I bought a house very affordably under $100,000 on the near west side this year. This is the only area that I could afford. I work for a nonprofit. And um, the idea that this could be converted into duplexes, triplexes, quadruplexes would be very detrimental to the city. And other cities have dealt with this. Other college towns have dealt with this. If cha major changes are, uh, are like if people want to make major changes, I think the onus is on them to show that by making significant changes like this, it has proved in other communities to address issues that they're saying it will address. Because the truth is, it hasn't and it won't. And so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to see what's going on in other communities. A number of other communities, college towns, are delaying any consider of consideration of this because of COVID. So there's no reason to rush this. And it's very significant decisions that you all can make. And we should base it on the experience of other organizations, other cities, 
and not just rush it through for philosophical reasons that are not based on the reality of the results of this kind of drastic zoning changes. And thank you so much for letting me give you my comments. Thank you. Next up we have Sandy Bonson. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, can you identify yourself please? You yeah. have two minutes. Sandy's uh, husband, John Bickley, uh, on Howe Street and the Prospect Hill. I would like to just make four quick points. I also agree to the idea of delaying this uh, study until after COVID is over so we have more time and we can meet face to face. Secondly, I would like to make sure that if we're going to do this, if we're going to attempt to upzone close in neighborhoods, that it should be citywide and not just uh, a west side issue or a south side issue or something like that. Uh, thirdly, uh, I really think it's important that the city provide us with case studies from other cities as dynamic as Bloomington, where upzoning uh, core neighborhoods has actually benefited the city and how it has benefited the city and if it has benefited uh, lower income families that need housing close in. Fourth, um, I, uh, my fear is by upzoning and creating a more density, you're going to create more absentee landlords who do, in my opinion, when walking around our neighborhoods, a relatively poor job of maintaining their properties. So um, that's all I had to say, and I hope I got it in between and under your time limit. Thank you for your time. Yes, you did. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Cynthia. Hi. Hi, this Cynthia. Is Can you identify yourself? You have two minutes. Yes, this is Cynthia Bretheim. Thank you for the time. Everyone's spoken so eloquently about the same issue. I'm going to bring up an the same issue with a different view. If the UDO changes are a sustainability issue, let it be noted that we're continuing to approve subdivisions in the surrounding areas that require houses that have, that require greater than 1200 square foot just on the first floor. We're still approving covenants that will renew themselves in perpetuity that preclude clotheslines. We're still approving yards with grass seeds that's written into the covenants. The racist issues with the single family zoning passed in the 20s related to subdivisions that are governed by covenants, which will not be changed by the UDO and which people continue to forget about. So that's really important that we collaborate not only with our own planning department, but with the county. And we should even take it further. If this is a sustainability issue, then let's look at those covenants and make recommendations to developers to make it so that houses are reasonably designed, that they have green lawns, that they have green energy systems hanging their laundry. Um, and let's get clear about the covenant issue with the core neighborhoods and quit taking it out on our precious core neighborhoods, the only affordable houses. And if you want to take care of racism, then denounce white nationalism and white supremacism. I've already asked the city to do that, and you're not doing it, and it bugs me. Yeah. And if you want to take care of our homeless, then please, please put up porta potties in places. Please take care of our people. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Next, next, Mr. Lewis. Uh, Bill Baus should be able to unmute. <clears throat> okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can, Bill. Um, and um, I also wish to comment on the um, uh, changes to the uh, zoning ordinance. And um, <clears throat> I live in the near west side. Uh, I have for half a century now. And this is the most diverse neighborhood in town. Uh, we have a variety of types of housing, uh, including a few uh, uh, plexes. And um, this is also 
uh, possibly the most affordable neighborhood in town. And that's because back uh, um, a few decades ago, we finally put in zoning to prevent uh, developers from converting these old uh, affordable houses into uh, apartments. And um, one of the wonderful things about the diversity of, of this neighborhood, um, historically, this was the only neighborhood that African Americans could buy or, or own or, or rent homes in. Um, and so the idea that turning this neighborhood into a series of apartments is somehow anti-racist is totally poppycock. And so this is a very important issue. It should not be rushed through during the COVID uh, uh, restrictions. Uh, this needs to be discussed when people can meet in live meetings with the city council. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next up, we have Kel, KEL, who should be able to unmute. Hello? Are they unmuted, Mr. Lucas? No. They should be able to unmute themselves. Okay. Um, I, I do have one comment that came over uh, chat from Wilbur uh, Bowie that uh, he asked that I read. And uh, Kel says uh, she's having technical difficulties. So perhaps while she's uh, figuring that out, I can read Wilbur's comment. Uh, Wilbur says, I've lived in Bloomington since 1999 and the shift I have felt in the town's character is extremely sharp. The buildings that have continued to house a large number of people have left many disillusioned. It is very much geared towards the students and the Council of Bloomington has only been seemingly ecstatic at the prospects of more, more and more. Not only is it ruining the unique feeling downtown used to have, making it feel like any other city in Indiana, now it seems they want to continue this trend to the few affordable homes in and around the town. It does not make sense unless you somehow, uh, unless you are somehow benefiting financially, which from what we can tell would not be uh, too many locals. More and more the real estate is corporatized and, this hap and once this happens, it will not ever return to the people. How is that progress? The push for more leniency on duplexes is not what the city should be focusing on if it wants the community to remain a community. On another note, there's a lot to be said for the few spaces in the town that isn't smothered in Indiana University paraphernalia and clusters of trash in yards for days. Some places around town are sanctuaries for creatures other than ourselves, one small plot at a time. I appreciate the council members that are will, uh, willing to hold a constituent meeting, which our representative did refuse. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lucas, I have nine by my count. Is that about what you have? I believe so. And okay, and we have two more and is Kale ready? I no longer see Kel in the meeting. Um, I do have one other comment uh, to read, if you'll give me just a moment. Constance uh, Glenn says that uh, they would like to express their support for the comments that have been made in opposition to upzoning. And is very concerned about equity and accessibility and housing and believe this proposal will have the opposite effect of what is intended. And I believe that is the end of the comments I've received over chat and I don't believe I see any more hands raised at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank the public for their comments. Um, moving on, do we have any appointments to boards or commissions? Seeing none, um, we do have legislation for second reading tonight. Mr. President, I move that ordinance, or sorry, resolution 2104 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that resolution 21-04 uh, be read by the clerk and by title and synopsis only. Will the clerk please read? 
um, point of order, I think we need to call Sorry. the roll and vote on the motion and then. Sorry, you're absolutely right. Will the clerk please call the roll? Rosenbauer? Yes. Scandalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Oh. Rollo? Yes. And Volan? Yes. Thank you. That passes 9 0. And will the clerk, will the clerk please read? Yes, resolution 2104, approval of interlocal cooperation agreement between the city of Bloomington and Monroe, Monroe County, Indiana, regarding building code authority. The synopsis is as follows. The attached interlocal cooperation agreement, Exhibit A, extends through January 1st, 2022, the long-term arrangement between the city of Bloomington and Monroe County to combine and coordinate the provision of certain building code services. This interlocal cooperation is authorized by Indiana Code 36171. Thank you. Um, I believe we have staff here to present. Uh, Mr. Rooker, would that be you? Um, Mr. Yes, Mr. President. Sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, my fault. <laughs> I move that um, resolution 2104 be adopted. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and second. Uh, Mr. Rooker, again, introduce you. Would you, are you here to present? Yes, thank you, President Sims. Uh, Michael Rooker, city attorney for the city of Bloomington. Uh, since 1996, the city and county have entered into interlocal cooperation agreements regarding building code authority. Pursuant to these interlocal agreements, the Monroe County Building Department serves as the building code authority for all properties in Monroe County, including those within the city of Bloomington. Uh, pursuant to the agreement, the city and county work together to make certain that all code requirements of the UDO, building code, fire code, and similar regulations are met. Applications for building permits are processed through the county's building department, and the building department makes certain to communicate with the city regarding certificates of zoning compliance and other matters that involve city departments with regard to construction, remodel, remodel demolition, or similar activities within the city. The interlocal agreement before the council tonight does not involve any substantive changes to the expiring interlocal cooperation agreement, except to extend the term of the agreement for one additional year. Uh, during the council work session, I believe council members Gambaluri and Piedmont Smith had inquired about the length of previous building local and building interlocal cooperation agreements, and they have varied over the years. For a number of years, the city and county negotiated agreements for five-year terms. More recently, however, we have been negotiating these uh, agreements each year. Uh, staff is recommending approval of Resolution 21-04 and the Associated Building Interlocal Agreement, and I'm happy to do my best to address any questions council members may have. Thank you for that presentation, Mr. Rooker. Um, do we have any questions from any council members? Council Member Rosenbarger. Sorry, no, I was counting um, on my screen. I'm sorry, no questions. Okay, thank you. Council Member P. Ma Smith. Yes, I found it interesting that um, the uh, building code paperwork is still on paper and not electronic. Is that something that um, the county and the city are working on uh, make uh, converting to an electronic format? I don't know of any specific um, plans to do that at this time. Now, it's possible that I'm simply not aware of them. I know that we have been doing that in general with the many, many processes and permits uh, that the city is involved in uh, with regard to the county building department and uh, permits that they process and speak to that at this time. Okay. I can Thank certainly you. raise it with the planning and transportation department though. Well, I was just uh, concerned, especially, I mean, since the agreement says, you know, once a day, the planning department will go to the, the county building department and pick, pick up the paperwork. It just seems very cumbersome, especially in a time of COVID. I think uh, in, that's an excellent point, Council Member Piedmont Smith, and perhaps in future years when we have um, the ability to more um, 
to renegotiate this agreement and work on it with, with greater detail, perhaps that's something we can bring up. I think that's a, a really a wise idea. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Volan. Yes, Mr. Rooker, thanks for the presentation. Um, is there a reason why it's only a one-year agreement? Can it not be a two or greater or longer year agreement? You know, I, I, I don't know that there's any specific reason other than uh, this is a, an agreement that will be retroactive. So uh, we may want to negotiate it at some point in the future. And when you sort of lock it in for five years, it can be difficult to um, to renegotiate an agreement, although you have that option. Uh, typically, if you have to think about it and talk about it, um, then, then we might just do that at the end of this year. I know we haven't looked at it substantively in a couple of years. Well, wait, wait a minute. I mean, is what is the normal length of this agreement? Is it always, do we renew it annually? We have been renewing it annually since 2018. So, and before that, we had a five-year agreement? Uh, before that, through t until yes, that's correct. We had done a number of five years agreements, five year agreements from 1996 through 2017. So, what was the reason that it went to one year in 2018? You know, I don't know the specific reason that we transitioned from five years to one year. Uh, I, I couldn't speak to that. Um, that's odd. Uh, I would think that somebody would know why the uh, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you. We have Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mr. Rooker, for your uh, discussion of this issue. We, can you tell us, just for the record, um, uh, how is this interlocal agreement in the best interest of the citizens of Bloomington? I mean, can you kind of just briefly say, uh, why is this a good thing that we do this? Sure. You know, it, I think the, the short answer is efficiency. It creates a one-stop shop. Um, sorry if I'm distracted. Apparently my cat has crept into the background, but um, <laughs> uh, it creates a one-stop one one shop for folks uh, who want to obtain a building permit. If you're in the city or you're out of the city, you work through the building department, there's a level of familiarity there. Um, so it's sort of breaking down barriers that would exist if we had multiple different departments um, performing the same activity inside and outside of the corporation boundary of the city of Bloomington. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further questions from council members? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll go to the public. Um, for public comment on resolution 21-04. Um, do we have any one ready to speak, Mr. Lucas? Uh, I'll remind members of the public that if you'd like to okay. comment on this resolution, you can do so by using the raise hand function by clicking the participants at the bottom of your screen and, and then clicking the raise hand. Um, if you're not able to find that feature, uh, or if you don't have that feature, you can uh, send a message via chat to let us know that you'd like to comment. At the moment, I don't see any takers. Okay, thank you. Give it just another second. Okay, hearing none, we'll go back to council for um, Further questions or final comments? Council Member Bolin. Yeah, I was gonna make a comment. Um, uh, I have been uh, content with the um, agreement between the city and the county for them to handle building permits. I do share a mild concern that paper is still the order of the day, but uh, you know, I, I believe the county does good work and saves us the trouble. Um, I am a little surprised that, uh, I mean, I'm not accustomed to seeing this agreement come to us uh, this frequently. And so it's a surprise to me that we're still on one-year agreements for the past three years now. Um, I feel like a two-year agreement would be reasonable, would save us a little trouble coming back here again next year. Um, so I'm a little surprised to hear that uh, we had five agreements and now suddenly we, you know, like uh, 
this this raises questions. So I would uh, urge uh, the administration to, uh, you know, work out whatever it is that needs to be worked out with the county. But uh, I, I, this is the kind of thing we shouldn't need to be doing every year. Uh, anyway, I'll support it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or final comments from our council colleagues? Seeing none, are we ready for the question? Okay, seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on resolution 21-04? Yes, Councilmember Scambolari? Sorry, yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Steve Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Volan? Yes. And Rosenbarger? Yeah. Thank you. And that is adopted nine zero. Um, and we do have more legislation for second reading tonight. Mr. President, I move that resolution 2105 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and second that resolution 2105. Five be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Councilmember Sims. Yes. Clarity. Yes. Piedmont Smith. Yes. Smith. Yes. Sandberg. Yes. Rallo. Yes. Bolin. Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. And Scambolari? Yes. Thank you. That passed 9 0. Will the clerk please read? Resolution 2105 preliminary approval to issue economic development revenue bonds and then the proceeds for the proceeds for the renovation of affordable housing. Sorry, I lost where I was reading. Regarding Crestmont Community 1007 Summit Street, Bloomington Rad 2 LP Petitioner. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution is for preliminary approval of the City of Bloomington to issue economic development revenue bonds pursuant to Indiana Code 36711.9 and 36712 in an amount not to exceed $30 million dollars the city would lend the proceeds from this economic development revenue bond to Bloomington Rad 2 LP, an Indiana limited partnership and its affiliated partners or limited liability company for the acquisition, rehabilitation and renovation of the affordable housing development known as the Crestmont Community at 1007 Summit Street in Bloomington. Bloomington Rad 2 LP and its partners would fully indemnify the city and take full responsibility for payment of the bond. The city would not bear liability, ongoing obligation, or costs related to the bond. The city would act only as a conduit, allowing the borrower to access capital at a tax exempt rate and receive equity for the project in the form of tax credits. The renovations to the community would focus on addressing code requirements, handicap accessibility, modernizing the units, and energy efficiency. Thank you. President. I move that resolution 2105 be adopted. Second. Thank you. Um, who do we have presenting this evening, Mr. Lucas? I'm sorry, I don't see, I'm sorry. I, I say now. How are you, Mr. Allen? I'm doing well, Mr. President, how are you? I'm good. Um, well, do you have anyone else with you this evening? Okay, I see Ms. Scobie. Okay, will you please present? 
Yeah, uh, since we have the experts here, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Amber Scobie and her colleagues at Ice Miller. I think that they can give the best synopsis of the project. Uh, of course, the, I'm here to answer any questions that the council should have uh, regarding the city's involvement in here. Um, I don't know if I believe Tyler Kalachnik may be presenting first or Amber, um, but give them a chance to. Okay. Is it Tyler or? I think it's Chris Cashman and Tyler Kalachnik. Both have a hand raised if be so kind to just, allow them to present. Both should now be co-hosts and should be able to control their own uh, audio and video. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Yeah, yeah, uh, this is Tyler Kalachnik from Ice Miller, Indianapolis. Uh, I'll just give a quick intro and then I'll turn it over to Chris and Amber to do the heavy lifting. But uh, this is a similar uh, to other resolutions for those of you that were on the council the past two years that have come before you for conduit financing. Um, the, at this stage, this is just an inducement resolution. Uh, so it has an important function to help um, the borrower apply for tax credits. And uh, before I turn it over, it, it's a kind of an exciting time for affordable housing. There was a federal legislative change uh, at the end of last year that permits uh, additional equity um, produced by these tax credits that uh, are go along with the issuance of tax exempt bonds. So uh, it does allow for, for some projects uh, to have extra funding and, and also some projects probably that uh, previously wouldn't have worked can now um, receive the, the funds they need. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Chris or Amber to, to go through the resolution and the project. Great. Right. Um, Amber Scobie, Executive Director of the Bloomington Housing Authority and also a member of the Bloomington Ride to LP Partnership. I'm going to share my screen for the presentation. Okay. Everyone can see this first page. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll just kick off with a reminder of the Crestmont community. It's on the northwest side of Bloomington, uh, west of Monroe Street, north of 12th Street, east of Lindbergh Drive, and just south of 15th Street. Uh, it's also the location of our main office, um, nearby amenities um, like the Ferguson Crestmont Boys and Girls Club, uh, Tri North Middle School, um, great location with uh, originally built in 1965, and it includes 196 uh, units ranging from studios to up to five bedrooms, and we serve uh, individuals and families. Uh, the Housing Authority, as a public housing authority, currently owns and operates it. And under this renovation and conversion through HUD's rental assistance demonstration program, we're changing the way that we receive our federal subsidy from public housing to the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So that's a change from uh, Section 9 financing to Section 8 financing. And that uh, rental subsidy comes in on what we call a HAP contract, a housing assistance payment contract is that Section 8 money that will act as the subsidy for the units. Um, it's much more stable uh, financing and, and generally uh, Congress funds it better than uh, public housing funding, which can change dramatically year to year. And after the renovations, the Housing Authority will continue to act as the property manager um, and our nonprofit Summit Hill Community Development Corporation um, is also in the ownership structure uh, of the redevelopment activity with the Housing Authority maintaining ownership of the land. Uh, just a reminder, some snapshots of what Crestmont looks like. Um, hard to believe these were taken uh, over a decade ago when we did some uh, major physical improvements. Uh, weren't able to do all of the units, but uh, this shows some of the exteriors and we were able to renovate some of the uh, interiors on one bedroom units and also our community building. 
Uh, so we're really excited about these renovations. We've been working on this for many years and waiting for all the right pieces to come together. And like Tyler said, uh, with some of the legislation and changes in how uh, tax credits works and also the RAD program, um, it's looking like a really good financing piece. So we're able to do the renovations, uh, bringing up code requirements like uh, wheelchair accessibility, uh, handicap accessibility uh, units for uh, those who are visual or hearing impaired. Um, just modernization, I mentioned Crestmont was built in the 1960s and we have some units where the interiors have not been extensively renovated yet. So um, you can imagine they're in need of a facelift. Um, also energy efficient um, heating and cooling systems. We do still plan to pay the utility costs and that um, is a tremendous help for the families. It helps them um, balance uh, their housing costs a lot more and installing those energy efficient uh, heating and cooling systems just allows us to control costs and it's great for the environment, of course. So um, also new roofs, um, site lighting, other site improvements for, again, wheelchair accessibility, all of those things um, need to be improved. Uh, interiors, we're doing a new uh, laminate vinyl tile flooring, uh, new kitchen cabinets, countertops. We're adding dishwashers and family size units, um, in unit washers and dryers, um, new windows, um, uh, new energy efficient site lighting, uh, lots of improvements. Uh, one thing that I'm excited about is we're adding eight one bedroom units by converting some existing three bedroom townhomes. We don't see a huge demand for three bedroom units, but we see a tremendous uh, demand for one bedrooms. And so we're reconfiguring some of the units in order to meet that critical need. Uh, also, I should mention we're uh, almost doubling the size of our community building. So that will allow us to host um, different events and also have resident service office space and space for our resident council um, in that community building, which um, we uh, got some input from our residents and uh, we think it'll be an exceptional space. Um, we uh, do hope to renovate each of the units and hope that renovation uh, last no more than uh, 90 days and tenants will be relocating on site within Crestmont and all of the moving and relocation costs are covered um, by the housing authority. And no new jobs created, but we will be retaining 10 jobs. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris who will just talk a little bit about the rental assistance demonstration program. Thank you, Amber, and good evening to the council. My name is Chris Cashman. I'm an attorney with ICE Miller, uh, who's uh, serving as bond counsel on this particular project. Um, if the presentation looks familiar to you, uh, to many of you, it's because it's nearly identical to a presentation we gave to you last year for uh, Reverend Butler and Walnut Woods project. So because of the success of Bloomington Housing and, and the support of the city on that project, we're back for for another project uh, with, with Crestmont that, that Amber described to you. I think Amber did a pretty good job of uh, describing the RAD program, which we also covered uh, on last deal. Um, but it's it's really just a way for, for Bloomington Housing to transition uh, to the Section 8 platform. So I'll cover uh, kind of some high level concepts of the bond structure and characteristics if Amber still has the controls we can switch slides if that's helpful for the folks. Um, but kind of two high level points to, to cover first uh, regarding the inducement. One, we're, we're really at the initial uh, approval stage. So you should expect to, if you decide to uh, support this project, see us back before the council uh, after we, we go back before the EDC uh, for final approval later on down the road. Uh, but the inducement kind of serves two uh, important um, uh, functions uh, for the project. One, um, it allows the borrower entity of which Bloomington Housing is a part 
um, to make an application to the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority uh, for bond volume and, and tax credits. And then it also sets a date and time uh, for which the borrower um, can reimburse itself from bond proceeds for expenses incurred uh, 60 days within the date of the adoption of this inducement. So it truly is a, a, a first step in, in many. Um, so we're in the step one of this particular slide. Um, and the, the previous slide, which I, which I skipped over, is really a visual representation of the true conduit nature of the city. Um, we have the borrower at the bottom uh, issues the bonds uh, and the bond proceeds flow back uh, uh, to the borrower with the city acting merely as a conduit. And if you go to the last slide, Amber, and thanks for your help. Um, the last slide uh, is identical to uh, the concepts that we discussed for um, Reverend, Butner, B Reverend Butler and Walnut Woods. So the bonds are issued as the clerk uh, read uh, pursuant to Indiana Code 36.7, 11.9, and 12. Uh, after this inducement phase, we'll need to go back to the EDC, which will hold a public hearing and, and render a project report uh, that's delivered to the council. Um, so the bonds uh, will not be payable from taxes or, or be a general obligation of the city. They're, the bonds are, are solely payable from the revenues of the project and issuing these bonds have no impact on the city's constitutional debt limit or being qualified limit. So that truly, you know, it's like I just said in three different ways, the city's truly acting as a conduit, allowing the borrower to access the tax exempt market. So um, I think that that covers some, some high level topics. I know the clerk read the not to exceed amount in the inducement resolution uh, that's before you as well. And and uh, Tyler, Amber, or myself are happy to answer any questions that the council may have uh, regarding this uh, inducement resolution. Okay, thank you all for the presentation. Um, do we have any questions from council members? Um, Council Member Scambolari. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, I think this is a question for Ms. Scobie. Uh, the materials we were given in the packet indicate that um, bonds would be for the acquisition, rehabilitation, and renovation of the affordable housing development and so forth and so on. Um, the rehabilitation and renovation, I understand, um, but could you comment on acquisition? Or is there something are we acquiring land as part of this or expanding anything, or is that just part of the language you use to describe these bonds? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so there is an acquisition of the uh, actual structures. So the units, they're currently owned by the housing authority, but the ownership is transferred to our partnership, Bloomington Rad 2 LP, um, of which uh, BHA's nonprofit Summit Hill Community Development, and then the tax credit investor that we choose will be in that ownership structure. So the Housing Authority still has a lot of control through the nonprofit, but it does become a separate ownership entity. Um, and then the Housing Authority retains ownership of the land. And that yeah, transfer is, is permanent, correct? Uh, not permanent, no. But um, I mean, or is it just for the duration of the renovation activity? Exceeds the renovation timeline. It um, it's for a number of years, um, more in the fifteen to twenty year range. Yeah, th this is Tyler Kolachnik again from my smell too. I, I just add to that uh, a great explanation by Amber, but. Uh, in addition, the, the reason that the tax credit investor is in the ownership structure is that's the only way they can get these tax credits. Uh, they have to have an ownership interest in the property. And so that's in exchange for that, they deliver the equity that goes for the project um, improvements. Great. Thank you for that. Thank you. Councilmember Sandberg. Just a quick question for you, Ms. Scobie. Um, 
With respect to the relocation, um, is that done for your residents by some sort of in-house process, or do you have to hire local movers to get them from their current spots that are going to be renovated to um, their um, their next location while they're waiting to get their their updates? A good question. Um, it's really a team effort with a few different players. So uh, we do have a consultant that specializes in RAD relocation. Um, there are some considerations um, with fair housing, um, civil rights, um, making sure accessibility is a consideration. And that consultant really helps us design a plan that meets all of the federal requirements. Um, as well as they have some knowledge on how the construction process will work and that phasing and how it would work on um, moving families around. Um, we do use our property management team to meet with residents and help go through a survey and really figure out if there are any special needs. Maybe there are, um, you know, um, accessibility concerns or someone has special instructions for moving, um, those all get uh, asked and discussed. Um, and then we do hire a, a moving service uh, to help move the tenants. So um, all of that is paid for by the project and by the housing authority. Great, thanks. And moving can be such a difficult thing anyway. Um, yeah. So it sounds like you're gonna make this as seamless as possible. That's great, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Do we have any further questions from council? Hey, thank you. Um, I do have a couple. Um, I think this is probably for Ms. Scobie, um, but I'm not sure. But the first one is just of interest to me in the improvements. Um, and you list a lot of things, um, which I think is good, but you mentioned air conditioner condensers. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, is that just the condensers or is it the entire units that we're adding? Uh, it should be the entire unit. I, okay. I think well, it, says, it just says air conditioner condensers. So okay. um, <laughs> I, I think the condenser is what makes the air conditioner. Well, I, yeah, no, the whole, the whole deal okay. probably needs replaced. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was just wondering how that was written. Um, and actually, yes, when we've heard um, from you all before. Um, I think we talked about hiring practices with regard to hiring um, minority women or other marginalized contractors or actually employees. Um, can you speak more on that and, and share with us how that has gone? Sure. Uh, so as Council might remember we are renovating Reverend Butler and Walnut Woods right now. And before we started that process, we did a lot of outreach uh, with different um, media outlets, community groups, uh, building associations, uh, talking about all of this money that we have to pay people to do this renovation work and especially encouraging uh, women and minority owned business enterprises to apply and try to explain the bidding process and what to expect. Um, so uh, we still have a lot of that information and in some of those companies um, that we'd work with and we'll continue to do some outreach um, and build some relationships with folks, whether it's um, the building trades, moving companies, um, you know, material suppliers, um, all of that. So we do track that each month. And so far, about 25% of the uh, funding that we've paid out has gone towards uh, women, minority, and Section 3, which is a low income, a business that's low income owned or has a lot of low income employees. So about 25% um, is going towards uh, those companies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any further questions from council members? Seeing none, um, we'll go to the public. Um, we have any public comments. Um, I will remind everyone to use the raised hand function in Zoom, or you could send us a message um, in the chat on Zoom. 
Um, do we have any takers, Mr. Lucas? Not that I see at the moment. Okay. Okay, seeing none, um, we'll go back to council. Do we have any um, further and final questions or final comments? Okay, did I say a hand, council member Smith? Yes, council member Smith. I just wanted to thank Ms. Scoby and uh, all the people involved in this for doing such a great job and uh, helping people out with moving and creating a, uh, a, a really nice affordable housing that's uh, for low income people. I think it's great. I think you do a great job. Uh, thank you very much for all you do. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any further final comments? Okay, uh, before we move on, and I too would like to thank um, um, Amber Scobie um, and our city's representative, Larry Allen, and our petitioners. Um, this is a good project, and I think it's a, a good community benefit with us trying to work with um, some of the women and minority owned businesses and then trying to um, uh, uh, utilize that workforce. Um, that uh, I think is very beneficial to the community. So um, thank you for that. And thank you for the presentation. Uh, any more final comments from council? Okay, seeing none, are we ready for the question? Will the, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, um, council member Flaherty? Yes. Kimoff Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Bowling? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambellari? Yes. And Sims? Yes. Thank you. And that passes 9-0. Uh, thank you very much. And we do have more legislation ready for second reading. President Sims, I move that Ordinance 2104 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded that, um, let me get my paper, Ordinance 2104 um, be introduced and read by the clerk, by title and synopsis only. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Um, Councilmember Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Bowen? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambellari? Yes. Sims? Yes. And Flaherty? Yes. Thank you, and that motion passes 9-0. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2104 to amend Title VIII of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Historic Preservation and Protection to establish a historic district regarding the core building historic district. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends Chapter 8.20 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled List of Designated Historic and Conservation Districts in order to designate the core building, the building located at the southeast corner of parcel number 53080510058000009, located at the corner of West First Street and South Rogers Street in the city of Bloomington, Monroe County, Indiana, as a historic district. Built in 1947, the core building still retains its physical integrity, 
architectural significance and association with the history of healthcare and medicine in Bloomington. While it is not the first hospital building constructed on the site, it is the oldest surviving building and is therefore a part of the city's healthcare legacy. The building is not listed on the National Register of Historic Places, nor has it been identified in the state or local historic sites and structures inventories, so it has not been given a rating. However, this is likely because the building is physically attached to a larger hospital complex that was built in various decades of the late 20th century, which most architectural historians would find non-contributing. Regardless, the core building is one of the few examples of Art Deco architecture in Bloomington and stands as a testament to the evolution of the original Bloomington Hospital site from farmhouse to medical complex over the course of the 20th century. Your committee recommendations do pass 9-0. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mr. President, I move that ordinance 2104 be adopted. Second. Thank you, it's been moved and second. Do we have comments from city representative? I believe Mr. Hedrich is here. I am here um, and I'm ready to run through a, a quick uh, presentation. Uh, if you guys uh, would, would like that. Yes, sir, we would. Um, it's nice to see you too. <laughs> to all right. All of you, thank you. Uh, so, Here we have the, the core building. Um, trying to get it to pull up. All right. Um, so this building is located on the uh, northwest corner of First and Rogers Street. You can see here the building outline. Um, it, it is currently structurally attached to the more modern medical facility, as uh, Miss Bolden uh, alluded to in the synopsis. So you can see the, the outline of the core building here and a medical facility here. Um, the property meets uh, historic criteria 1A because of its association with the evolution of Bloomington Hospital site and uh, the history of healthcare and medicine in the city. Uh, and its historical value is the oldest hospital building still remaining on the site. Uh, the first hospital in Bloomington was established thanks to the efforts of the local Council of Women, which consisted of leaders of various civic clubs in the city. The Council of Women raised $2,500 through fundraising and donations, and then with this money, they, they purchased the building you see before you, the, the Hopewell Farm, in 1905, uh, which was a two-story, 10-room, uh, brick, Italianate farmhouse uh, with a barn and four acres. The hospital at that time had a total of 17 beds. Uh, by 1918, there was a shortage of beds at the Hopewell House, due in part to U.S. involvement in World War I. Um, again, the local Council of Women answered the call. They spearheaded the effort to raise the money needed to expand that hospital. Um, thanks to donations and the sale of Liberty Bonds, $60,000 was raised, and renowned architect Alfred Grindle designed a revival-style limestone building that you see there um, that doubled the amount of beds to 35, and the Hopewell House then became a nursing school, so this was 1919. And this uh, building was... Uh, I believe attached to the Hopewell House. By 1944, it was cleared another expansion was needed. Uh, the local Council of Women uh, was able to secure a $94,000 federal grant and they raised a matching amount, once again, donations from the community. Uh, that money was used to expand upon the 1919 hospital and the core building you see before you, um, designed by a firm McGuire and Shook, was finished in 1947. This was a state-of-the-art facility at the time that added 75 beds. Um, and modern upgrades, including radiology departments, so they had the ability to do x-rays, uh, clinical laboratory, and a pathology lab. Uh, and this is, a, I wanted to point your attention to this, this diagram here. Uh, this is the core building, and this is a hallway that attached it to that 1919 limestone building. So uh, the two of them together kind of formed an H for the hospital site, how fitting. So in 1965, uh, we have a $12.5 million medical facility constructed at 200,000 square feet, 200 beds, uh, new healthcare departments. Um, and at that time, the original uh, Hopewell House was demolished uh, to make way for this new construction. Uh, the 1919 building and the core building were then remodeled uh, in the 60s uh, to become a 60 bed convalescent hospital referred to as the East Wing. Uh, the hospital site continued to be expanded and developed throughout the rest of the 20th century. And in the 1900s, that 
Alfred Grindle Design Limestone Building that was built in 1919 uh, was actually demolished. So, so that left the core building as the oldest building remaining on the site. You know, ultimately the uh, history of the building really highlights the efforts of the local women who they just continuously fought throughout for the adequate health care um, and who as a result made a significant positive impact on the well-being of this community. Uh, this property also meets uh, criteria 2G because it's architectural characteristics that can be identified as Art Deco. Uh, Art Deco was a popular architectural style in the United States from the late 1920s throughout the 1940s. Uh, this is significant for Bloomington uh, because the city has relatively few Art Deco style buildings uh, outside of the Courthouse Square. Um, so this building was designed by the architectural firm McGuire and Shook, who was based out of Indianapolis. Uh, the firm was recognized at the time for designing several school and hospital buildings across Indiana. Um, here locally, the firm designed the facade. You can see the Wicks building, uh, this Elks Lodge here, Simon Music Hall on the IU campus, um, and what was the Citizens Loan and Trust building, which was on the west side of the square. It's not, no longer there. Uh, other notable Art Deco style buildings in Bloomington are the Monroe County Jail and the Coca-Cola bottling plant. Uh, so, you know, the core building is certainly a, a refined expression of Art Deco. Uh, it expresses some of the more signature elements of the style, such as the uh, bold massing, the smooth exterior finish, uh, and decorative motifs that you see here uh, below the windows and above the entryway. So, uh, once again, uh, it meets criteria 1A um, because it's association with the evolution of the Bloomington Hospital site, and criteria 2G because its architectural characteristics are identifiable as Art Deco. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hedrich. Um, do we have any questions from council? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the public. Um, if we have any comments on ordinance 21-04 and I will remind you that you can indicate that by using the raised hand function in Zoom, or you can contact us through chat. Okay, Mr. Lucas, do we? Yes, I do I see. I see. Yes, Dolase, you should now be able to unmute. Good evening, council members and Hi, Mr. Hello. Dulce, can you identify yourself? And you'll have five minutes. I can. My name is Mark Delasi. I'm vice president at Indiana Landmarks. And I actually spoke to you in favor of the ordinance at your committee meeting last week. So I will keep my comments brief just to say that our organization is in support of the uh, ordinance before you tonight. Um, and we do support the committee's due pass recommendation. We're thrilled at the uh, open and transparent approach that the city has taken to the redevelopment of the hospital site and that the and believe that the retention of this building is a part of that overall development will add great character to that uh, area. So we would ask that you support uh, the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, comments. Do we have any more questions or anyone else from the public? Mr. Lucas? Not that I see, no. Okay, seeing none, we'll return back to the council. Before that, I see Mr. Crowley um, has joined us. Do um, you care to add something, Mr. Crowley? Thank you, President Sims. I I, uh, I presented as part of the uh, staff presentation last week. There were a couple of items that I wanted to follow up uh, with the council on that were that came out from that, um, and uh, and so let me do that if that if that's okay. There were basically uh, two different uh, issues and questions that had been raised. The first was the question of whether or not. Uh, adaptive reuse of this building would be precluded uh, for medical use. So that was the first question. Uh, the second one that I wanted to follow up on was uh, was a little bit more detail surrounding low, low income housing tax credits and how historic designation plays into that. So if I may just address those two items uh, 
with the council just to just to follow up on them. Um, yes. So yes, please. Thank you. In the instance of the first uh, question, which has to do with any restrictions on reuse, um, the the basically the answer is uh, there is no restriction per se on the core building itself. However, uh, there is a restrictive covenant on all of parcel A, which is what this sits in. And it may not be transferred in whole or in part to a healthcare competitor of IU Health's without IU Health's prior written consent. So there's a pr provision in the agreement that we have with IU Health, and it would require that additional step if there were a medical competitor that the building uh, would house in the future. So uh, that, that's the answer to the first question. I don't know if I should pause and uh, or, or keep going with the second question. I think you keep going with the second, and if we have questions after that, then we'll proceed. Okay. So the second question really had, had sort of two parts. The first one, what was the timing associated with low-income housing tax credit applications and awards in 2021? And how does that tie into, as, as you know, the uh, the, the timing consideration we're all working under is the decision as to whether or not demolition would affect this building at the time that the demolition would would affect the remaining stuff. So, uh, so the the short answer is that uh, awards, according to the uh, IHCDA uh, preliminary schedule, the awards would be due, or I'm sorry, the applications would be due in July, and awards would be made in November, which would give us time between the time a, an applicant would be a, uh, awarded uh, a, a tax credit and the decision point. So we would in fact fit within the decision period. So I wanna make sure that everybody understood that. Uh, a little bit more complicated is the question of, you know, other issues to be considered in the, in the, um, the designation and how that affects the low income housing tax credit project, uh, especially for 9%, which are the competitive projects. Um, so basically what, what uh, I think we just have to be aware of is a couple things. One is having designation actually helps a low income housing tax credit, but there are certain limitations to it that, that uh, in order to get the points that help an application, 50% or more of the ultimate units have to reside within the portion of the building that is the historic portion. So if we were to build a, an, um, you know, an additional wing on the back of the building, for example, as it was contemplated uh, in, the master, in the master plan, half of the units at least would have to reside within the existing historic structure. So I just wanna make sure everybody's aware of that. That can be limiting. It's not necessarily limiting, but it is something that has to be considered as part of the process. So it comes down to footprint size and how many units of the total can fit within this uh, older building. Um, and then the other thing uh, that you know is important to recognize is you know the the, the points um, are certainly important in that you know they they represent a maximum of three points. We had a a developer that we uh, par have partnered with in the past run a very quick and dirty estimate of what maybe a, a, a building uh, adaptive reuse might look like. They felt that that uh, potentially points could be uh, the the three maximum points could be applied to this project. And just to give you a sense of what that means, it's a it's about three it's three points out of probably 115 points. So so it's not huge, but it does you know sometimes these are won and lost on several points. So so every point is important in a project like this. It does uh, end up uh, representing additional cost, however, for the developer. And so there's a cost implication as we move forward on this to consider. Uh, because it will be more costly for a developer to do an adaptive reuse of a historically designated building than it would not. Um, so I, I, I know you're aware of that. I just want to reiterate that. So, you know, I think bottom line, the, you know, as I said last week, um, we, we will work very hard uh, in, and, and put out an RFQ and, and work very hard to find a development partner that was willing to do something with this building if we can find one. Uh, we will know whether we have that partner in advance of the decision point that we need to make at the end of the year. Um, it, it appeared from the last discussion that there are ways in which if we end up coming up empty, we, we may have to revisit that decision. 
Um, but at this point, um, it looks like it's worth pursuing uh, our, our path forward to do a, a, an affordable housing, adaptive reuse of the site, maybe something else, but, but certainly uh, affordable housing as a, as a primary priority for the site with the understanding that we may get to the end of the year and have to make a tough decision about the building. So I'll stop there and, and um, pause for any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Crowley, for following up with that. And sorry I didn't um, see you lurking down there. Actually, that probably wasn't the right word. <laughs> okay, um, since we have this second presentation, do we have any uh, questions from Council? Council Member Rallo. Thank you, uh, Mr. Crowley. I had a question about just to maybe flesh out the, the approximate number of affordable units that could be accommodated in the existing structure and then with the re restrictions in mind and in addition how many more could be added well we've gotten two very different estimates on that number so i hesitate to to answer in one case someone said that that uh you know that, that it would be somewhat limited uh in that um it may not be able to um have you know 40 or 50 units. And in another case, someone said to us that they thought they might be able to put 20 to 25 per floor, which would allow it. So I have not uh, gotten comfortable with being able to answer that question based on the, at how wide a range we were presented in both of those uh, data points. Um, it, it, it seemed to me, though, that there was at least you know, some confidence that, that we could get to in excess of 100 units total for the, for the building, with it, maybe with an addition. Um, and so, you know, that, that's important to understand because obviously there are construction efficiencies that come from uh, a greater unit count. So, 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 you know, I'm, I'm somewhat positive that, that we can uh, potentially attract someone to do, to do a project. I'm not familiar with the actual um, dimensions of the property. Uh, I wondered also, could there be is there a possibility of a non-attached structure that could be used to expand affordable housing on site, or is that impossible? And within uh, the footprint, the housing tax credit does not require that the buildings all be connected. So one way to overcome any size limitations on and or you know distribution of units on any given uh, property relative to the threshold of that 50% is uh, you, you can actually pair it with another building that can be, you know, in another part of town. So there is a, there is a way to, uh, to achieve that end goal without having to do it in proximity to the original building or for that matter, attached to the building. Uh, but, but at this point, we have not paired it with another historically designated adaptive reuse projects. So we would have to try to understand where that might be in order to hit that threshold, if that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. And so it, my interpretation is, is that that restriction in terms of an addition, not exceeding whatever, 50% uh, of, the, of the units in the new addition, there might be a way to, uh, to find, to add more, more units, take advantage of the, of the tax credits keep the building intact, et cetera. Is that right? Is that how I'm reading it? Right, except that from a mathematical perspective, you want to uh, you want to heavy up on the units that sit inside the building in order to get the points that you would get from it. So you wouldn't want to pair it with a building that's substantially larger because then that would diminish the actual, mm -hmm. you know, the percentage. Gotcha. But but your point is well taken that that again, you know, there there could be other sites that could help to augment and certainly that's the master plans uh, direction, which is uh, looking for opportunities for affordable housing throughout the, the hospital site. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, do we have any further questions from council members? Okay, I'm um, getting a new presentation. I think we should also, or seeing none, we'll go to the uh, public. Um, if we have any other comments, I think we do have one, but I will remind everyone that you can um, indicate you want to comment by using the raised hand function in Zoom or contact us through chat. Mr. Lucas. 
Yes, and, and apologies. I think we had a request for a public comment come in earlier, and, and I missed that message. So we have uh, Chris Sturbaum would like to comment, who shouldn't be able to unmute. Yes, thank you. I've enjoyed watching the council in action. Chris Sturbaum commenting. Hello, Mr. Sturbaum. You have five minutes. Thank you. You know, this isn't a purely business deal. There, there is a lot of history involved in this building. And that has been clear from the presentation to you all about the story it's going to tell 100 years from now about how Bloomington started its hospital, how the, you know, the women of the community made that happen. And I'll tell you, it's solid as a rock. You know, that building really can, deserves reuse. And I want to remind you too, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen on the hospital site. But with this holding a corner, even those trees will be saved. And that's going to be in place for the 10 to 15 years while the build out takes place. And I'm a little uncomfortable with this very short deadline because, you know, I worked with the, the person that the city worked with to do that project on West Third Street in that wreck of an old limestone building that no one thought had any future. And it is now cleaned up, it's beautiful. The old trusses are exposed. It's a community building for the affordable project. And that worked out beyond anyone's expectations when most people would say there's no future on that site. And we saved it because it was an important building as historic commission, you the council saved it. It was an historic important building. And I wanted to also speak about the track record of saving these buildings that have always been called white elephants, have been awkward. And like even the, even the discussion about the courthouse originally was that it was impractical, that it, we, know, we could have had underground parking and, and a two-story brick structure that would have been so much more efficient. So I wanna say the track record is almost 100% on these buildings that the council has saved because of the recommendation of the Historic Commission. And I would, I would suggest that it's going to possibly take more time than this very short end of year timeline to find a future, but that it's worth it and that a future has so far always been found for the important buildings in our city. So vote partly with your, you know, dollars in mind and the practicality of it, but also the beauty of preservation is that there are transcendent values that aren't just dollars and cents. And they speak to our community values and they speak to our community's history. And this will read like a book for another hundred years, 200 years, who knows? It will also serve the immediate need of a real homeless population possibly. They're, they're homeless who, who have uh, small rooms in the project on West Third Street. And this developer, if he gets into this, would do maybe micro units for, for previously homeless people. So there are a million reasons to support this, but don't worry about the deadline and the economics at the end, it, it finds a way when there's a good project like this. And I predict this will be the best building on the hospital site in 10 years. So thank you for your time. I'm signing off. Thank you for your comments. Um, do we have, or going back to council for any final comments or final questions? Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. We certainly had a robust discussion about this uh, earlier at our Committee of the Whole. Yes. I wholeheartedly support the designation of this, and in large part because of the story that was told and uh, out of uh, respect for the local Council of Women, thinking back how hard those uh, four mothers worked to make sure that Bloomington had adequate uh, hospitals 
uh, for our community, all the way up from the fundraising that they did and the expansion that they did over time. And this being one of the more uh, lasting uh, parts of that story, I think is in and of itself significant. If it can be repurposed for affordable housing, all the better. Um, so again, uh, without further ado, I completely support the designation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any further final comments from council? Council Member Boland. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that uh, over time, my esteem for this building has slowly grown to the point where I can't imagine the city without this building. Um, I appreciate very much the efforts that Mr. Herterich, Mr. Crowley, and city staff have made toward its preservation. Uh, I'm happy to support this ordinance and I'm earnest in my hope that a use will be found for it. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments from council, final comments. Okay, seeing none, are we ready for the question? Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, council member Bert Smith. Yes. Council Member Sandberg? Yes. Council Member Rollo? Yes. Council Member Volan? Yes. Council Member Rosenberger? Yes. Council Member Scambalori? Yes. Council Member Sims? Yes. Council Member Flaherty? Yes. And Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And that is adopted 9 0. We do have more legislation for second reading tonight. Mr. President, I move that Ordinance 2105 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded that Ordinance 21. 05 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Sandberg? Yes. Councilmember Rallo? Yes. Volan? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. And Smith? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. That passes 9 0. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2105 to amend Title VIII of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Historic Preservation and Protection to establish a historic district regarding the Boxman Mitchell Building Historic District. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends chapter 8.20 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled list of, Histor of designated historic and conservation districts in order to designate the Boxman Mitchell Building 424 and a half South Walnut Street as a historic district. The proposed district consists of two buildings. The Northern Building is a one story wood frame building with a red brick veneer on the northern facade facing an alley and on the east facade facing South Walnut. The southern building is a two-story wood frame building with a red brick veneer on the east facade. Both of these structures were built in 1925 by Ira Mitchell, one of the Mitchell brothers responsible for a string of commercial structures that were built along South Walnut in the 1920s. The Mitchell's brothers left an indelible mark on the urban landscape of Bloomington. They built at least four brick commercial block buildings and a handful of brick homes along South Walnut, all of which survive to this day. These buildings are part of the architectural fingerprint of the city and form a recognizable pattern along its southern corridor. The building is also notable for its historical association with Henry Boxman, a local rest restaurant entrepreneur who operated Boxman's restaurant from 1929 to 1958. Boxman named, gained national recognition for his food and also boasted the first neon sign and air-conditioned dining experience in Bloomington at this location. Your committee do pass recommendation 
was 0, 8. Mr. President, I move that Ordinance 2105 be adopted. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Um, Mr. Hedridge, will you present again this evening? Absolutely. So, uh, this property meets the architectural criteria 2B uh, because it belongs to a group of buildings designed and constructed uh, by the Mitchell brothers who significantly influenced the development of the community. Um, I'll stand by this assertion until I see evidence uh, that uh, proves otherwise. And um, so we'll leave it here for a second. Uh, several lines of evidence point to the Mitchell brothers of Bloomington as original builders. Um, and owners of the structure, but property records and old city directories indicate this. The building sits on seminary lot 20. Uh, records show that Ira Mitchell purchased half of seminary lot 20 from his brother Stanley in 1923. Tax records indicate the lot had a land value of $720 at that time with no improvement value, uh, so we know it was a vacant lot. Ira bought the other half of the lot 20 from the Abrams in 1925 and started construction. The 1925 to 26 city directory um, tells us a lot. It's the first edition that lists 424 South Walnut as an address. Uh, so we can assume it did not exist beforehand. Um, the directory states that Ira and Ada Mitchell owned and operated the Dew Drop Inn at this location and lived on the top floor of the two-story portion of the building. Uh, finally, the materials and, and design really follow the pattern of other local Mitchell buildings. Um, you know, it, it lacks some of the uh, more architectural detailing and decorative features found on the later Mitchell Brothers buildings, but it does have that characteristic red brick uh, step parapet. Um, it's also marked with the builder's name. Uh, on the upper half of the brick facade here um, of the two-story building section, there's an M pattern inlaid with the lighter brick. Uh, this feature can be seen on a photograph of the building found on a postcard from the 1930s. Uh, this is the earliest photo we have of the building, um, although this is not showing us the, the M up here. Um, and then this is the next one, I believe the early 1930s. Uh, we have the, the sign out here. It's now Boxman's, and I know Henry Boxman changed the name of the restaurant from Dew Drop In to Boxman's uh, in about 1931. So this must be 31, 32, 33. Uh, now we have air conditioning. Um, and we have a, a fancy neon sign and we have a vestibule in front. So this is uh, late 30s. Uh, and do note that we do see an M here. Um, and then these are from the 40s. Uh, I believe this is 1940s and this would be 1950s. You can see it kind of evolved throughout the decades there. Uh, testimony from Charlie Boxman, uh, who actually moved uh, and lived on the second story here when his father um, oper operated the restaurant. Um, really uh, supports this conclusion. Charlie states that the M emblazoned on the upper part of the brick facade does stand for Mitchell. Um, staff finds a property meets architectural criteria 2G because its form, architectural features, and building materials are representative of an era of history characterized by a distinctive style. The building in its current form existed in 1925. The 1927 Sanborn fire insurance map that you see here on the left-hand side um, gives us a lot of information about the building. Uh, it, it's uh, a wood frame building uh, with a brick veneer. Um, it, uh, these two sections, you can see it's divided into essentially three sections. Uh, and I've divided it for you on the screen up here. Um, I believe that this section uh, was a, there, there used to be a door right here. This was a small mercantile store. This section in the middle was the player's pub. This section over here, the southernmost section, the bottom floor was private offices uh, for a stone company. Uh, and then the upper floor was used as apartments. And that's all indicated here in the Sanborn maps. Um, the building is a unique combination of one part and two part commercial block. Uh, the incorporation of the dark red brick veneer, which is a Mitchell Brothers favorite, along the south, busy South Walnut corridor uh, was certainly purposeful and intended to impart you know, a kind of sense of grandeur while hiding that humble wooden frame underneath. Uh, to further highlight this technique, that two-story section is a step parapet. Um, the windows along South Walnut were the most ornate. You can see them here. 
uh, featured an operable divided light awning window above large plate glass storefront windows. Uh, these narrow vertically oriented divided light windows really are a uh, characteristic found in arts and crafts bungalows of the 20s and 30s. Um, and then of course we had the limestone lintels uh, above the windows and the doors, which is a, a kind of a local architectural fingerprint. Uh, the later addition really adds to the identifiable architectural legacy of this building. Um, we can see here, it starts as a simple uh, wooden vestibule, uh, is eventually turned into kind of a glass block rounded uh, vestibule with uh, aluminum fascia and a bright neon sign. It was it's very streamlined, modern, um, and this vestibule, I think, has really acquired its own architectural significance um, and is, you know, if it's restored back to that, is certainly a, a remarkable and, and rare site in Bloomington. Um, Evansville actually boasts a really neat art modern style structure, a Greyhound bus station that was uh, restored and turned into a, a burger joint. Um, so this property also meets historic criteria 1A because of association with Henry Boxman, a nationally recognized restaurateur and local business leader. Uh, age 25, uh, Henry Boxman uh, leased uh, the Dew Drop In restaurant. Um, which was owned and operated at the time by Ira and Ada Mitchell. Uh, it was often referred to at that time as a barbecue stand. It was a popular after-school gathering place for local high school students because it was only a block away from the Bloomington High School. Um, Henry didn't change the name initially or the menu, and he continued to serve short order items. Um, by 1932, Boxman uh, kind of pivoted his strategy. He shook that short order image and he re remade his menu and it became a more formal sit down dining experience focused on quality food and service. He renamed it Boxman's Restaurant at that time. Uh, by 1940, uh, his restaurant featured the first air conditioned space and commercial gas fired heating boiler in Bloomington. He also had the first neon sign. So Boxman not only survived the Great Depression, he, you know, when a lot of other small businesses went under, uh, he came out ahead, and because Henry was a, a shrewd uh, businessman, he had great marketing ability and foresight, and really kept his restaurant at the cutting edge of uh, industry innovation. Uh, in the 1940s, uh, Boxman served as a food consultant to the U.S. Secretary of War. 1950s, uh, Boxman's restaurant had essentially received nationwide recognition. His Bloomington eatery gained the attention of food critic pioneer Duncan Hines. Uh, being recommended by Duncan Hines became the gold standard at that time. Um, so it was a pretty significant achievement. Uh, Boxman was also very active in state and national restaurant associations. He was the second person inducted into the National Restaurant Association Hall of Fame. Uh, restaurant, uh, Henry Boxman was a restaurateur to remember as food put Bloomington on the map, says Carolyn Tucker. Uh, this good food reputation uh, is proudly continued by Bloomington today. Boxman really cultivated the short order high school hangout into a Dining landmark uh, grabbed the attention of national food critics. His business weathered a Great Depression and a World War. Uh, this building has significant value as part of the cultural heritage of the city and is associated with a person who plays a significant role in its development. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from council um, for Mr. Hedrich? Uh, Council Member Bolin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hudrich. Thanks for the presentation. As always, uh, I think it's uh, uh, interesting and useful. Uh, but I did want to ask uh, uh, maybe a, a minor question. You said something about this being the first, uh, the, the this building being the first time that 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 it, it had an address. Would you uh, say that again? Yeah. So. Uh, Pretty uh, nifty tool to use when you're dating buildings is uh, local city directories. Mm -hmm. um, and we're fortunate to have every single directory for every year from 1900 to the 2000s. Um, okay. So a building was built and around 1922 or 25, you can go back and, and see, you know, when that address first made an appearance on the directory. You can see when it wasn't on it and then you can see when it appeared on it. And it's kind of a good way to, to help you know, a narrow down a, a date of construction. Well, um, I'm going to share my screen here because I want to show you something that I think you'll find useful and it informs this discussion as well. Can you see this screen? Can anybody see this? 
Yes. Um, this is a, a study I found uh, while doing research. Uh, I think everyone should know about it. Um, it's pretty self-evident. Uh, this was done by a, a B school professor, 1951. And the reason I mention it is because it has some useful maps from before 1900, including this one. Let me uh, move to it here. So uh, the author, here you go. Can you see this map? This is a map of Bloomington in 1841. And uh, the black, gray, and uh, striped uh, icons denote uh, commercial, industrial, uh, high grade or intermediate to low grade residential areas. And the professor found these by looking at uh, you know, property tax records going back that long. The reason I, I think of it now is because this is the address you're talking about here. And even as early as 1841, he was able to find records that showed that there were buildings here. There were property, there, there, there was some, I mean, this a whole gray area here was, uh, you know, the settled city of Bloomington. So uh, the property you're talking about is right on the corner, but uh, it's still, I mean, you see it consistently. There's another map here of 1876 where you see that this corner is, uh, is studied by the professor in this 18, 1951 study. So I wonder if maybe there weren't buildings there before this one, not that it diminishes the existing building, but I just wanted to call your attention to that because I think it's relevant. So um, I'm happy to forward you a copy of it. I mean, it's publicly available, but uh, I, I feel like for uh, downtown studies, this is a really useful map and a really useful uh, 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 history of the city of Bloomington that everybody should know about. So thanks again for, uh, uh, for the presentation. That's it for me. Let me unshare. Thank you. Yeah. And could I just speak to that, you know, one moment. Uh, what I, what I, that's a really great source and I would absolutely be enthusiastic to, if you would share that with me because it would be really helpful in my research. I'm sure, yeah. Uh, but what I use uh, is the Sanborn fire insurance maps. They're really, really detailed and good. And, I, and I, when I looked at the 1913 map, uh, there were no buildings uh, on that corner or where Boxman's uh, restaurant is. And then in 1927, the next year that the map was published for Bloomington, the building appears. So that kind of- I mean, it's, it's, it's entirely possible that the land was, uh, um, you know, again, this is in the map, it's marked as intermediate to low grade residential. So there could have been poor small houses that were torn down before 1900. Uh, it's hard to tell because this is not meant to be uh, a Sanborn like uh, study. You know, it was a business school study. Uh, all I know is that uh, uh, from, according to this map, there were property tax records that the professor used to determine what the nature, I mean, it was something was built on it. It might've been insignificant enough that, you know, it, it didn't uh, make history. So uh, anyway, I just, uh, that, uh, that a thought occurred to me when you presented and I thought you should know about this, uh, this map. And I think that it's in general, it's of interest to everyone in Bloomington. So thanks again. Thank you, Council Member Bowman. Do we have any other comments from Council Member Rallo? Or any questions, is that right? Yes. Uh, Mr. Herderick, uh, at our last meeting, uh, there was a question about notification uh, and of the building owner uh, to that meeting. It could could you speak to that? Was that appropriately done? I'm I'm uh, I, I'm curious as to whether or not that um, the ball was dropped or 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 somehow uh, he wasn't failed to be notified. Sure. So, so from my point of view, um, you know, I, I work in at the hand department, I staff the historic preservation commission, um, kind of, uh, I, I, I communicate with the, the property owners or the people involved in these matters, uh, before and through the historic preservation commission. Um, once a property is recommended for historic designation, I always explain very carefully what happens next. Um, which is that it goes to the council at an 
unspecified time because you know at that time we don't know sometimes it's two months sometimes it's a year before we can get on the council uh calendar so um at that point in time it kind of goes into the council office uh and, and how they run things if they want to communicate with uh people who are on agendas or stakeholders or, or anything like that that's what i understand i see so there there is a break in communication then in terms of uh, when it goes to council scheduling, whether or not, uh, if it is, if it does go, if it is scheduled to council, who then proceeds to notify the the owner, the property owner? Is it does it is it fall back to the hand department? Is it the council office responsibility? Who who, who does that? Uh, it's it's unclear at this moment who does that, uh, but it certainly hasn't been the hand department responsibility in the past. Okay. Council member, Council member Rolla, I think um, uh, our staff, Mr. Lucas, would like to respond to that. Yeah, so after uh, your, your concerns were voiced last week, um, uh, I followed up and, and uh, spoke with uh, Deputy Mayor Mick Renizen. I, I think the short answer is it's not been consistent from department to department. So I think in this particular case, it was uh, a case of uh, each staff member thinking the other had had followed through with this. So I, I will know Mr. Alley is present tonight um, and we'll continue to, uh, to work with uh, the department heads and uh, uh, the mayor's office to, uh, to sort out who wants to take responsibility. I, I certainly uh, uh, understand that council members want uh, any stakeholders to be uh, uh, notified of, of these meetings. So um, I think uh, Mr. Herderich is uh, not wrong that uh, that's how his department may have operated in the past, but I, I don't think that's that's uh, consistent across the department. So we'll we'll continue to coordinate with the mayor's office on this question. Uh, thank you. Uh, and just to be clear, I'm, I'm not interested at all in affixing blame, but, but the, my concern is just to make sure that you know, it's, it's very hard to make a decision about this if the property owner is may not be present or not prepared because they weren't notified, et cetera. And so, um, thanks, thanks for looking into that. I'm, I'm confident it won't happen again. Thank you. Any further, Council Member Scambolari? Yes, thank you. A um, couple of questions. First, Mr. Herderich, you spoke a little bit to this, but could you comment? In, in more detail on the current condition of the building and what it would take theoretically to repurpose it or to renew it. That's a little outside of uh, my kind of scope of work and, and what I do professionally. I'm not a structural engineer or an architect. I'm an architectural historian. Uh, so it's that, uh, you know, I haven't done an assessment on the building, nor would I be professionally qualified to do such an assessment on the uh, structural condition of the building. Okay. Uh, if there are others on the call who might have that expertise or might have the ability to comment, I would be interested in hearing that. Um, I'm going to stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any further questions from council? Seeing none, um, we will go to the public. And I understand that Mr. Josh Allen is with us. He is a, a property owner, a representative of this parcel. And I think it's um, appropriate to ask him if he would have anything to offer in this conversation, um, specifically with structural condition. Hey guys, can you hear Yes, we hear you. <clears throat> the, uh, yeah, as far as the structural condition and, and just going back a little bit, uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, and I, I, sorry, your name escapes me, but uh, thank you for trying to make it right going forward as far as the notification goes. Um, I think that would be very important, you know, to, to any stakeholder just to be notified about the process or at least what to expect and, and definitely when the meetings are. So thank you guys for addressing that going forward. I know it does help what's happened, but at least it fixes it for anyone in the future. Um, as far as the structural condition of the building, um, as I alluded to guys last week when we were on the call, I, got, I own a couple of the other Mitchell buildings. Uh, one is at 1300 South Walnut Street, the other one's at 1500 South Walnut Street. Um, those buildings were restored to the current conditions. Um, they 
they aren't anything like what this current building is at 424 South Walnut Street. And so what I mean by that, those two buildings were all brick, they were sound. Um, it, it wasn't necessarily too complicated to make those buildings right. Um, and if you'll notice, guys, I'm not sure if you've ever paid a whole lot of attention to, they've got keystones right in the front of them that very clearly say the Mitchell name. Um, and so it's, it's, not, it's not hard to argue that those were Mitchell buildings. Um, this current Mitchell or uh, this current building at 424 South Walnut Street, um, when we originally bought the building, the goal was to try to figure out how to repurpose the building. Um, we like taking ugly buildings and, and, and bringing them back to life and making them pretty again or, or taking an eyesore and, and trying to be good neighbors and, and just make the community a, a little more pleasant for people to drive by. Um, at the same time, when we're doing this, there there is an economic consideration into into what we're doing. Um, when we first took a look at this building, uh, we had a structural engineer take a look, and he estimated that given a condition like just to make it safe for people to actually go in, um, it was in upwards of three three hundred thousand plus dollars just to just to allow people in the door. Um, that's, that's fortifying the roof. That's not putting a new roof on it. That's just fortifying a roof so it doesn't fall in. Um, the, uh, but upon further architects, upon further contractors taking a look at the building, um, the seal plate in front of the building is, is rotted. Um, I know you guys all remember the, the, whenever they did the, the sewer and the water construction pipe going down South Walnut Street that was a bear for traffic, you know, that summer in August when they did all that work. Um, the Jordan River used to run through the, I believe it's the northeast corner of that building. Um, all that ground right there is sinking under it. Um, the other thing that makes this hard, you know, from a cost or an economic standpoint is the building, I, Connor showed all those pictures earlier. From my count, there's at least nine renovations that have been done to the front facade of that building. Um, there's six different colors of brick that are currently on there. Um, the, uh, the windows are all, all different. There's, there's only one window that has the old glass in it. All those other windows, guys, are replacement windows or even plexiglass. So, um, and, and so there's, I, if we were to try to preserve it, I don't know what look we would try to go to just because there's been so many. But, but all those renovations have been done over the past. Um, and then I'm sure everyone remembers the pit stop that was there and kind of the, the old shingles that, that were on it. Um, all that work, that refacing, taking off, putting on, um, it's taking a toll on this building. And so ultimately, we were told by three contractors, I, I know I sent you guys the letters and, and recommendations from those three contractors that we should start new, um, just because this building was unsalvageable. And those guys, I've, I've done work with them in the past, and, and I take their opinions to heart. Um, and like I said also last week, a lot of these conversations were prior to COVID or right about the time when the pandemic hit. And this was also before the cost of goods rose 30 to 40%. Um, and, you know, post pandemic or, or being in the middle of pandemic now, it even makes it harder for us to make this building. It makes it harder than it was before. It was already hard before and almost impossible before from an economic perspective, um, but it's even harder now. Um, and guys, I'm not a developer. I, I do this stuff as a hobby. I have a day job. I'm not a, I'm not a rich person. Like I, I like to do this because I live here. Um, I'm not an out of town fun fella. You know, I, I, I live here. I drive past this stuff every day, just like you guys do. Um, and so it wasn't without a whole lot of, of work and due diligence that, that we came to the conclusion that we needed to file the demo permit. Thank you. Do you have anything else with Charlie? No, sir. Okay. Thank you very much for your um, input. Um, do we have Council Member Scumbler? You're, you're muted. Sorry. This would be my second round, so I'll defer if anyone else has first round. No. Okay. Um, Mr. Herderich, I, I appreciate what you've said, um, and I appreciate your role as an architectural historian. And so it's in that role, um, I guess I need your help thinking about this. Um, much of the reasoning behind making this a behind a historic designation, much of the foundation for that argument 
um, is Mr. B is the story of Mr. Boxman. I think it's an interesting one. Um, I also know that he, based on this story, operated a restaurant at a time uh, in Southern Indiana when segregation was the practice. Uh, and I'm wondering what you have found about that since we last talked. Obviously, it was a topic last week. Um, but I'm wondering what else we, we have found out about that in the time since, if anything. Sure. So I have uh, traced um, and read and um, explored different avenues of evidence for this. Um, I know uh, Mr. Alley provided um, some, some documentation that he, he thinks um, indicts Mr. Boxman um, as participating in de facto segregation. Um, you know, and I, I took that very seriously and I, and I read everything that, that he had to say. I read those primary sources. I asked some more people, I read some more sources. And um, while I think it uh, is likely that Mr. Boxman, or there's at least more than a 50% chance that, that Mr. Boxman's uh, restaurant did participate in de facto segregation, uh, there's absolutely no way to definitively prove that he did. None of the evidence names any of the names um, of, of the restaurants who did. Just for one example, there were seven restaurants targeted by a sit-in uh, in March of 1950 by the local NAACP um, downtown restaurants. Uh, five of those restaurants, uh, well, all, first of all, all seven served uh, the, the sit-in uh, strikers, but five of them closed immediately afterwards in protest. But two remained open. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there were some restaurants that, that did not participate in this. We don't know who they were, who did, who didn't. So, you know, all we can say now is it's, you know, kind of it's guilty by association. Um, and, uh, you know, that's where it has to end here. But, and that's where I ended my, my research as well. I did follow uh, Councilmember Sims. Uh, idea about the green books and, and I was able to find green books um, that have been digitized uh, in the Library of Congress um, and uh, from the years uh, 1935 to 19, you know, 41 and then 46 to 55 and um, none, none of those green books uh, in the section on Indiana included Bloomington. Um, so Bloomington just wasn't a, a city on the, in the green book um, and, and maybe that's because there wasn't a large enough African-American population here. Um, but I do find it surprising that uh, Bloomington wasn't in the green books. Uh, but, you know, just again, I couldn't find any hard evidence supporting those allegations. But, um, you know, I can certainly see that there is a chance that, that Mr. Boxman did participate in that. Thank you for that. And I appreciate the um, additional work you've done since last week, too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any other um, second round questions from council? Okay, seeing none. Um, Mr. Lucas. Okay, I see Mr. Alley has his hand up. Is, is, does he have more he wishes to add or, or was that from the first go round? No, I, I do. I'm, do you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the uh, in in what Connor said, like I wasn't wishing to indict anyone. I just want to make that clear. Um, the uh, I know Connor just stated that he can't, you know, or that he thought there was more than a fifty percent chance that the building was segregated, and so where a lot of this information came from, it was in the the mid forties. It's not hard to find, or even this being Black History Month, essentially, and. I know that uh, the university just released a statement from George Telefaro, who was uh, a pretty well-known football player back in the day in the early 50s. And when he went to Herman B. Wells, essentially, and, and told him that he couldn't eat anywhere in downtown Bloomington. And so when Herman B. Wells started looking into this, he, he also saw that there was no restaurant in, in downtown Bloomington. Essentially, if you were African American in the late 40s, early 50s, or even before, you had to go all the way to the west side to be able to find a meal. And so that's what prompted 
um, Herman B. Wells to get involved. And I know Connor stated earlier that Mr. Boxman was the Restaurant Association president. And then even there's there's in the archives at the uh, University and in the Monroe County Library in 1981, in an interview, Mr. Boxman confirmed that he was the, the president of the Restaurant Association. But also in those archives, Herman B. Wells in 1951 went to the president of the Restaurant Association, which, which only one can assume was Boxman, and said that if he doesn't open up or if Bloom, that restaurants in Bloomington don't open up, then, then he's gonna squash them with the union. He'll, he'll essentially mandate all his staff go to the union and meet and not in downtown local establishments and, and the same with all the students. And so that's, that's, that stuff is not hard to find guys. Um, and, and like I said, that happened in the early fifties and then Boxman sold the restaurant in 1957. Um, the other thing is, um, and I know we sent this, but if if we can't prove that this restaurant was segregated, they can't also prove that the building was built by Mitchell. Um, I've got a deed that shows in 1921 that that, I, that Mr. Mitchell bought it from Fred Rumpel in 1921, and then even predating that, like uh, Council Member Vogel said earlier, like there's other property records there, and and like I said, I'd be happy to send them to Connor. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, Mr. Lucas, is there anyone else uh, from public comments? And again, I'll remind anyone if they do, you can please use the raise hand function in Zoom or you can contact us through uh, the chat function. Yes, I believe Chris Sturbaum would like to comment and should now be able to unmute. Yes, thank you, and hello again. Hello. I, I wanted to start by saying that this is coming to council because of demolition delay. And what demolition delay does when a building that could be significant comes before the commission, we give it one last chance. The ask is, why does this building have to die? You know, should it die? Should it be saved? And that question, is why it's in that question has been brought to you for final decisions because it's complicated. You know, what, what good are these old structures? You know, when this gets rebuilt, there will never be a beautiful dive like the player's pub again. I mean, there's a certain e economics to the small building. So that's even a, a practical manner of why do we keep old buildings? And, you know, in, when they unearthed Pompeii, there were probably buildings that addressed the street about the same as this little building that had so many different restaurants in it for 96 years in Bloomington. So the form is there. The form is workable. Somebody bought it. And maybe they bought it to fix it. Maybe they bought it to tear it down. I'm surprised they didn't look at the condition of it when they bought it. But they seem to be very surprised after they bought it. So somebody is going to tear it down. So it becomes a question of, do we keep this 96 year old building that's, you know, older than most people that are in the city and that has a ongoing function. And, you know, as a planner, I look and say, there's a vacant lot right next door. Wouldn't that be a good place to build something new and keep something old? That way you have condition. So, I understand it's become a racial question. And before the 50s, it's pretty obvious if you turn over any stone downtown of any restaurant that went through that period, it's not going to be a pretty, pretty result. And, and that's, that's something that did not come up at the Historic Commission. It's come up here. It's come up here. And I understand that impacts council's decision as well. But I just wanted to say that the human scale of this building, the functionality of the building, the ongoing purpose of the building, that there will not, there may be a bar in there, but it's going to have to pay about three times the rent or four times the rent that, that the old bar paid. And, you know, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. And really, that's not our business either. So you guys have to consider a lot more than the Historic Commission did. And that's why the law says the commission can only recommend, and we recommended that you take a good look at this building. There are reasons that it should stay. 
and there are clearly reasons that it should go, and it was a close call. But I just wanted to clear it up, why it came to you, what we did about it, why you guys are the ultimate deciders of whether this building stays or goes. And I, I have a feeling I know where this is going, but I just wanted to speak up for the old building one last time, because that's, that's what I do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lucas, who do we have next? I believe I saw a hand raised from Tyson, although I'm not sure if they'd still like to comment. If they do, they should now be able to unmute. Are you with us, uh, Tyson? Yeah, are you there? Yes, we are. Can you identify yourself, please? It's Craig Smith, and I don't have any comments. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, who else do you have, Mr. Lucas? I don't believe I see any other requests for comment. Okay, thank you. Seeing any more, we'll go to council for a final comment. Council Member Rollo. May I ask a question first of the, yes. of the own, owner of the property? Uh, Mr. Alley, can you hear me? Are you still there? Yes, sir, I, I hear you. Thank you. Um, so you intend to demolish the structure. What do you envision for the site? Just in to vague honest, terms. To be honest, we, we, it's, it's been bounced around a couple of times, but we had a clear plan, but that was, we had a, we had a vision when we bought the building, which was to restore the building. But then when you start peeling back the onion, you know, things got a little complicated and that's when they got costly. Um, the, then when we filed the demo permit, more delay, more pandemic stuff, more cost rise. Um, and so I know you guys talked a little earlier about the UDO, um, whether to pass it, whether to not pass it. And so it, depending on what you guys do, it kind of opens up some more options, you know, in terms of what we could do, whether it's all residential or whether it's um, commercial on the first floor with uh, supporting residential above it. But to be honest, um, right now, we, if we do get the permit, um, as I spoke last week, we're having a ton of issues um, keeping homeless, the homeless population out of the building. They keep breaking in no matter what we do as far as trying to, to secure the building. Yeah. So, I, I understand, but I don't want to belabor this, but I just want to know, are you intending multi uh, multi-story residential is that is that no, what I'm hearing? I think, um, I, I think our, our our if you had to ask me if I had to do something tomorrow, what we're going to do is demo the building, plant grass seed, and sit and wait beyond the pandemic and see what happens. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I I have a comment, but I I can wait, Mr. President, or I can continue. What would you prefer? Um, actually, we'll. Still have the final. We're about to get into final comments, um, and I'll call you back, Councilmember Volan. Yes, I, I do have one more question, uh, Mr. Alley. Uh, you've uh, presented an interesting case. Um, I guess uh, I mean I, there's also been a discussion lately about um, allowing uh, landlords of commercial buildings to allow the first floor to be used as residential, at least. Uh, permission on a short-term basis. Uh, so I, I take it that you've said this just now too, that whether it's residential or commercial depends on what we do tonight. Um, I recognize the uh, dilemma that's causing some people to call for first floor residential, but I guess my question is, uh, and maybe this, is, this question isn't for you, maybe it's for uh, the lawyers. Um, would you be willing to install a commercial hood regardless of whether the first floor is commercial or residential? Do you understand what I'm asking you? To be honest, no. Commercial hood, what does that mean? If you Something would that would allow a restaurant to be, to occupy, in other words, one of the biggest oh. expenses uh, of a restaurant is to install a commercial hood. It's a, yeah, yeah, a high five figure. Yeah, yes, sir. Um, thank you for, for clarifying. The, uh, I, uh, this place already has a grease trap there just uh, because of uh, it, it, was, it was there before. We don't know if it's functional, but 
but at this moment in time, would we install a commercial hood? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm not saying that you should. I'm saying if you tore this building down and you built a new building, would your plans for any new building include a commercial hood? Uh, and I don't, with all due respect, sir, I don't know that I can answer that question today. Um, the only reason I say that is because it, it depends on the viability of a commercial tenant. And so if we have a solid commercial tenant, then, then potentially, um, but if you're asking me if I wanted to ever open or, or operate a restaurant, that answer is, oh, shoot, no. No way, sir. Well, I mean, do, do you mean to tell me, well, no, I'm not asking you to open a restaurant, but do you mean to tell me that you can't imagine a future where this building, a new building on this spot would be a viable place for commerce? No, I, I think it would absolutely like be a viable spot for commerce. Okay, so. because the, the next best thing you could do to saving this building is to ensure that a restaurant comes back to this space, even if it's in a new building. Do you see where I'm going with this? Well, with all due respect, I, I think you're asking me to predict the future and, and I, can't, I can't do that. And so, you know, there's right now, there's, if you go outside, and turn right there's there's a bunch of tents parked right there next to the restaurant and so um and and like i said before like i i struggle keeping homeless people out of this building so like it, like if you're asking me what the future looks like for the space i i don't know sir I, I really don't and i'm not trying to dodge your question or anything but i just don't feel i can answer it thank you i appreciate the answer thank you um do we have any other uh, Council Member uh, Rollo. Uh, thank you, President Sims. Uh, I'm sorry I opened that can of worms, but I was kind of interested in terms of the prospects for the site, knowing that the comprehensive plan calls for, uh, as a gateway corridor, uh, you know, uh, a probably a, a, a mix of residential and commercial, if not, well, at least multi-story. Uh, that's probably what we'll see develop here, um, but it's I I impossible to say. But let me back up a bit just to say that, you know, I, I know people watching have fond memories of the Players Pub. I do too. Councilmember Sandberg uh, has performed there and many friends. Uh, and so I, I do have fond memories. I don't doubt that there are architectural features that are uh, have value of this building, but you know I have no reason to doubt that the structure is is fundamentally unsound. Having been in the structure before, and being worried about the foundation uh, of it while I was standing there with maybe fifty or hundred other people, um, I think it would take a considerable sum to to repair. So the question is, is is the uh, is is the historic nature and value of the building worth preserving. It seems to me the Boxman legacy has sort of mixed reviews. It seems to be uh, kind of embedded in a, in a time of, of institutional racism that it was prominent in Bloomington. And so the, it, it, we have to consider that as well. Uh, and I also consider the, the fact that the, the comprehensive plan calls for, I think, a fundamentally different building there, a different structure and different use of the site. So with all that in consideration, and Mr. Herderick, I appreciate all the work that you did because it was considerable effort to do the research that you did and, and then follow up and that sort of thing. So no fault of yours, but I don't think this, this clears the hurdle. I think that uh, I, I, as I did in my preliminary vote last week, I can't support this for preservation. And so I'll be voting a, a, against, thank you. Thank you, um, Councilman Rollo, and I'll we'll remind our council colleagues that we're now in final comment. Um, Councilmember Volan. Thank you. Um, I agree with Councilmember Rollo that this is uh, interesting and a tough call. And uh, I have to say that um, uh, it's one of the more interesting cases. It's certainly become one of the more interesting cases that I've seen. Um, the Players Pub uh, sort of demonstrated the relative poverty of the layout 
within the building. Uh, some of you may recall that the front door used to be the main entrance to the one story part of the building. And you walked in and you were walking between the stage and the audience. It wasn't until the most recent owner moved the entrance to the back of the building that it made more sense. But even then, uh, it was, um, uh, it, I don't know who called it a dive just now, but it was definitely a, a dive. Um, and uh, the, the building needs a lot of work. I can definitely attest to Mr. Alley's uh, assertions on that end. Um, uh, Mr. Alley had a very persuasive case until I asked him my last question. Um, I uh, absolutely believe that 10 years from now, this space will be a viable mixed use space that we will not need to, um, uh, to uh, require it, to, to allow it to be only all residential. Um, and that, uh, I mean, if we can't, as a city make South Walnut Street, which was rehabbed by this city just a few years ago. Uh, if we can't make it commercial on this spot, we might as well give up trying. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, I don't know that this building has to be preserved, but commerce as a function here, even if it's supported by residential above, which I'm fine with, uh, is a no brainer. I understand full well what Mr. Alley is going through at the moment, uh, trying to keep the building uh, from being used as a, as a, uh, I mean, the, the fact that people are breaking into to try and, uh, and crash in there or whatever they're doing, uh, sums up Bloomington in 2021 in a nutshell. Um, but that's a issue for another time. As far as this building goes, uh, I agree that it's probably not worth saving, but I find it difficult to accept that the owner of the property uh, is, is, is uh, thinking, I mean, so if, if he's going to take the building down and put grass seed on it till COVID passes, uh, that's a sign that it's likely to not get developed until commerce is vile, vile, viable not vile, viable in this building again. So I have a hard time taking it down without that promise. I don't mind giving him permission to take it down, but I refuse to believe that it's only viable use is residential only. So the installation of a commercial hood would um, uh, sort of, you know, like it's a 50 to $75,000 cost roughly. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to say that it could be all residential until someday. But the putting of that in is a good faith effort to say, we recognize that this is going to be a commercial center or that it can be a, a viable place for commerce. And that's the difference for me. I'm very, very eager to hear what my colleagues say about this. Uh, but right now I'm leaning against demolition purely for that reason. And I'd like to hear what my colleagues have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Scambler. Yes, thank you. Um, I feel the need to frame my comments here um, just because of some of the language I heard um, earlier this evening. Uh, please know that even with my very limited knowledge of architectural history, um, I have a great deal of respect for it. I've worked for IU for decades and have worked in some of its oldest buildings and respect them. I am grateful for the vision and hard work that the Cooks did to restore Fountain Square when a lot of people thought it wasn't worth saving. Um, I am not interested in killing any building. Um, and that's not what this ordinance is about. This ordinance is asking us to look at this building uh, and decide if it merits this historic designation. Um, I understand, I think, and I appreciate some of the architectural contributions. I think it's an interesting story about the Boxmans and the Mitchells, um, but there is still a great deal missing here for me. Um, not the least of which is a building that is safe 
and sound or can be made so relatively easily. Um, as I understand what, what's been shared tonight, we don't have that. Um, honestly, I'm, I am not satisfied that we have enough information on Mr. Boxman and his practices yet. Um, because if indeed segregation is a part of this site's history, then we, I think we have an obligation to tell that story uh, and to acknowledge that that was part of the city's history. Um, we don't have that information. That's why IU reserves naming opportunities for five years uh, and will not name a building after someone until five years after their passing. Um, I think there, I've not, we seem to also be missing um, particularly clear ideas on how this building could be restored and renovated in a cost reasonable way uh, in the near term. Um, we clearly have a need, I think, for, and we're getting there, for a more rigorous process for working with owners for these kinds of properties that come up. There is just a lot missing here for me. And so uh, with that, I'll be voting no. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Flaherty. Thank you, President Sims. Um, I'm not, yeah, I kind of share the views of, of both um, Council Members Rallo and Scambolari, so I'm not gonna rehash that. And we, of course, discussed this at our committee the whole meeting last week uh, and spoke on it then. Um, respectfully, I'll disagree with Council Member Boland's um, assessment. I, I don't think that the future use of the building is not like, I guess, I guess whether or not commercial or residential is there, whether or not Mr. Alley wants to, you know, install a commercial hood is like not to me the way we should be making a decision about whether we designate this property historically. Right. Um, and certainly, you know, people can differ on that opinion, but I just think um, to me, that's not the question, uh, I guess. And uh, so I wanted to push back a little bit on that. And I think it's a more of a zoning code issue. And, and if we want to require that through zoning code, we, you know, should certainly talk to planning staff and possibly pursue that. Um, but, but that would be the proper avenue for that, I think. Um, that's, that's really it. Uh, I, I kind of share the reasoning of my colleagues on this. I, I just, just didn't um, clear the hurdle, was I think the way Council Member Rallo put it, and I, and I agree. So uh, I'll be voting you know, tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Sandberg. I will be voting no on the designation as well. Uh, again, um, I listened very attentively to all of the things that were said during the Committee of the Whole. Um, and I don't like um, being in a position of giving the okay for uh, a demolition of a historic building. I do think they're precious. I do think that we should do everything possible to try to salvage them when and if at all possible. And if they can be repurposed and used in a, in a thoughtful and, uh, and uh, beneficial way. That said, I, I think the condition of these buildings is such that I, I, the case was made for me that it would be a hardship for any developer, whether it's Mr. Alley or whether he's going to grass it over and end up selling the property to someone else. Um, I don't know that any developer would have the wherewithal to incorporate any kind of historic uh, restoration to anything else that they would want to place there that would be um, lucrative enough for to make, make it worth their while. Building buildings is costly. Uh, we, we know this, and so we need to keep that in mind. The issue of whether he is going to demolish this and grass it over, that, that again is not our, our issue to answer tonight. That's more of an issue for the planning commission and our planning staff uh, and the ongoing discussion about how we're going to direct the uh, new projects that are in our gateway. Um, and, and of course, uh, we understand everybody is reeling from the pandemic. Um, I, I certainly have the utmost empathy and sympathy to the current owner of this property. Um, but I think that's kind of moot to our discussion tonight, which is about the value of designating this and not allowing it to be um, torn down at this point. So very sadly, I will be voting no. Thank you. Council Member Smith. Yeah, I will be voting uh, no as well. Um, we talked about it last week in Committee of the Whole and the uh, basis for historic designation is, is pretty weak. 
yeah, in my mind. Um, and so uh, it, it, it's a spot that, um, you know, I love the Players Pub. I used to go in there a lot, see council member Sandberg playing our ukulele and the band. But um, it's, it's, the building is just way beyond it. It's, uh, it's a mess. So let's vote for some progress for the future in this one. And um, let's, let's get the builder to do what they need to do to uh, develop this for the bet for the better for Bloomington. So thank you. I'll be voting no. Thank you. And a further final council member Pete Montsmith. Yeah, I can't support this historic designation either. Um, mostly because uh, the building has been so altered so many times that it really is a stretch to, to say that it's historic in its, its current state. And secondly, um, that the condition of the building is just so poor that uh, I think that uh, it, it, it's, it would, it's asking too much really of the owner to, to try to resurrect um, something that has been so altered and that has uh, uh, declined in quality uh, to such an extent. So I'll be voting no, thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, and I'll take a crack at it. Um, uh, I'll be voting no as well on this. Um, and I really appreciate the, the comments from my colleague and I agree with many of them. Um, a, a couple of things that I'd really, really like to touch on here. Um, I think last week when, with regard to talking about segregation and, and some of that history, um, I, I mentioned the word educational um, and, and community discussion. I think I also said in my estimation, what we were talking about with historic preservation had to do with the architectural value and importance of that building. So we've kind of joined these conversations, which is, you know, can be helpful. Uh, but what we're here tonight for, it's really, it's interesting, but probably not as helpful as we all kind of think. Um, I, I will say this, um, there's been some comments that uh, we've looked historically and we couldn't find it. Um, uh, Guess what else we don't teach our school kids? Hit black history. What else can we not find in many cases in the Hoosier room at the library? Black history. So that does not surprise me that we're not gonna find those details because that history does not um, positively reflect on the, the, the power brokers of the day. So let's just kind of get that off to the side. <laughs> That's one of those things. Um, I mentioned green books. I mentioned a lot of other things. Again, that was for the community discussion, I think, in education. Um, I heard some things tonight about a NAACP um, uh, doing some sort of a protest in 1950. Um, I'll have to do my research. Uh, I was the president of the NAACP, and I don't think we were even founded until 1968. So I'm going to have to, to look into that. Um, but, but that's part of the conversations when we just uh, have these conversations. Um, I also heard from a public comment that it could be if, if the rent could be for the next owner or the next um, inhabitant three or four times the rent than it was in the past. But that's not our business. Well, I disagree with that. That is our business to consider that in addition to and beyond the historical designation. If that was not the case, and we wouldn't be doing so many things downtown during COVID to save a lot of our businesses or to, to do what we can to help that. So that is our business. Um, this is not a tough call for me. Um, it is if the building was in good shape, intact. Um, we all know its condition. So it, this really wasn't a good call to me. And I was kind of, it was interesting to see how this conversation kind of went uh, uh, kind of away from where we are. Um, I still think it was robust. I still think it was um, a learning experience. And I want to thank you all for that. So I'll be voting no. That's my comments. Um, 
Council Member Volan. Thank you. Um, a couple, I want to make a couple of points based on what I've heard. Um, I do think the question is moot, uh, but I want to address the concerns of my colleague, Councilmember Flaherty. Uh, this property had a commercial use. I represent the downtown. I am not just a resident, but I've been the proprietor of premises much like these, which had a liquor permit, a license from the health department, and had been subject to inspection by the health, uh, a license from the fire department, had been subject to inspection by the fire department, sorry. And I stated my case that because I thought of this as a toss up, a close call with gaps in our knowledge that made it difficult to determine what to do, that my vote became dependent on, uh, you know, the, if all else being equal, what's the uh, proprietor going to do to make the building viable. They don't have to actually commit to commerce on the first floor uh, right away, as long as they put in the one thing. Anybody, I mean, if there's anyone else here who's run a restaurant or provided food to the public, they'll know that if you don't have a commercial hood, it makes it really difficult to do anything except maybe a sandwich shop, okay? A real restaurant needs a commercial hood, period. And that's the costly thing to install. A sewer, you know, uh, interceptor for fat oil and grease. That's another thing too. But I mean, they had it, and it, you know, if you're building a new building, it's not such a big deal. But a commercial hood is a big deal. So, and Mr. Sim says rightly that what happens there afterwards is in fact our business. It may not be directly. We have. We may not have a direct say over exactly what they should do, but. If anyone here is serious about South Walnut being a viable commercial entity, part of town, uh, you should be thinking about this sort of thing. At least I do. Uh, okay, that's fine. It's not gonna make a material difference in the vote tonight, but the last thing I'll say is I realize now, and I have just forwarded the, uh, the map and the study from 1951 to Mr. Herderich, who I hope will find it useful. Um, and uh, happy to forward it to other people. It's public, uh, public library. But I realize now there had to be buildings on this spot before 1900. Why? Because they were right across the street from the university. IU moved to Dunn's Woods in 1883. So it's reasonable to imagine that that area of the town became less desirable enough that there might've been no building there by 1900, but there had to be buildings there because it was the closest corner to what is now Seminary Square. So uh, based on everything I've heard tonight, I too uh, will be voting no on this. Thank you. Thank you. We have any final comments? Okay, Council Member Olaf. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to add that relevant to this conversation, when you're imposing historic preservation on a structure, it may come at a, at a cost, and a cost obviously for uh, the owner developer and in terms of restoration and so forth. There is no, my reading is there's no objective measure for us to, to, to determine what that cost is. So Mr. Herderich can't provide it, the HPC can't provide it. Um, we often get that information from the owner but obviously they have you know, uh, a vested interest in what their outcome is. And so perhaps we need to think in the future about some sort of objective measure by which we can determine if a structure is structurally sound enough to redevelop. And, and uh, that's just something for consideration. I think in this case, there's no doubt that this, is, this structure is too dilapidated to preserve, but, but in the future, I think that we may need that clarity. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Scambolari. Just one very quick comment. Um, I just especially want to thank Mr. Alley for being here um, and for your thoughtful and very candid and straightforward answers. They were very helpful um, to me and I would guess several of us in thinking through this. So just thank you, Mr. Alley. So. Thank you for those comments. Uh, Anything else from council members? 
Seeing none, are we ready for the question? Will the clerk please call the roll? Um, Council Member Rallo? No. Bowen? No. Rosenbarger? No. Scambaluri? No. Sims? No. Flaherty? No. Piedmont Smith? No. Smith? No. Sandberg? No. Thank you. And ordinance 21 05 fails 09. Uh, we do have another piece of legislation for second reading. Yes, um, Mr. President, I move ordinance 2103 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It has been moved and seconded that ordinance 2103. Uh, be introduced and read by by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Folan. Yes. Rosenberger is out. Scambaluri. Yes. Sims. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. And Rollo? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And that passes 8 0. Um, will the clerk please read? Yes. Ordinance 2103, formerly Ordinance 2033, to amend Title II of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Administration and Personnel regarding Chapter 2.02, .02, Boards and Commissions Revised, and Chapter 2.04, Common Council Revised. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance is sponsored by Councilmember Volan and would amend portions of Title II of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Administration and Personnel. The ordinance makes the following changes. It requires that certain information about each city board or commission be maintained on the city's website and revises the process to be followed upon a board or commission vacancy. It revises Bloomington Municipal Code Section 2.04.050, regular meetings, to clarify that the council may schedule its summer recess as needed. It revises Bloomington Municipal Code Section 2.04.255, Committee Scheduling, to clarify Council Committee Scheduling and the process of referring legislation to a Council Committee. It revises Bloomington Municipal Code Section 2.04.270, Ordinances and Resolutions, Filing Copies and Agendas, to specify that the Council President is authorized to approve the agendas for committee meetings convened to consider legislation referred to them. And last, it deletes Bloomington Municipal Code Section 2.04.290, Ordinances and Resolutions Fiscal Impact Statement Required. Please note that this ordinance was revised after distribution in the legislative packet, but before being introduced for first reading at the December 9, 2020 special session. The revision added the third whereas clause and cited a new Section 4, amended Section 5, to clarify Council Committee shall not meet to hear legislation during any scheduled summer recess, and renumbered subsequent sections accordingly. Also note, this ordinance was previously introduced and discussed under the former numbered Ordinance 2033, but was renumbered as Ordinance 2103 and revised with an updated signature block to reflect the new year and election of a new council president on January 6, 2021. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh. I'll, I'll go right ahead. Um, go right ahead. Thank you. Be okay. right back. Um, President Sims has asked that I take the gavel very briefly. Um, do we have a motion? 
Council Member Flaherty. Uh, yes, Councilmember Scamillary, I move to extend the administration committee's time for reporting on Ordinance 2103 to the February 17th regular session. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion or comment? Councilmember Flaherty. Sure. Just to explain the motion, uh, this is uh, legislation that had already been referred to the administration committee and has had uh, two meetings in that body across uh, two years. Um, and we were simply ran out of time at the last committee meeting uh, to discuss some of the issues we were considering. Um, hence the motion to extend the, the time for reporting back to the council. <coughs> Thank you. Council member Voland did, as chair, did you want to comment or offer any additional information? Uh, well, I'm both chair and the sponsor of the legislation, but I would say that, uh, uh, as I've often said that, uh, more deliberation is better than less, uh, the committee wanted to continue discussing it. I think we should let them, uh, but it does require a motion and, uh, you know, eff effectively a third reading. Uh, so that's what this motion would accomplish. Okay. We have a motion and second. Are there questions from council? And with that, I will turn this back to President Sims. Thank you, Vice President Scampolari. I am back. Um, I'm assuming we're to the vote on the motion. Um, or, or actually, Mr. Parliamentary, can you repeat that? I missed that. Yeah, that's correct. I think we're, if there's no more debate among council members, we're ready for a vote on the motion to extend the administration committee's time for reporting on the ordinance okay. until February 17th. Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, do we have any other council comments. I heard Council Member Boland. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Parliamentarian, is this a public comment offering? Uh, no. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Um, okay. Seeing no other comments, uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Sorry. Yes. Um, Councilmember Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Dumont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Garabo? Yes. Volan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I think that passes eight zero. Um, and I think, uh, Mr. Parliamentarian, I would like to refer this committee to next week. Um, do we take a motion from the I, council? I don't believe we need to take a motion to um, refer this to committee since it's already um, been with that committee. I believe the chair will just be able to uh, call a meeting for next Wednesday and perhaps um, whatever other committee meetings we have uh, uh, based on actions later tonight um, will determine that schedule. So I don't Mr. think we President. need to consider a motion. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Bowman. Uh Point of order. Uh, I don't know that uh, for legislation uh, that's being referred to committee that the chair of the committee needs to call the meeting. I think that's something that can uh, is done by the president. So I I'm don't sorry, I think, my per permission. No, I think referral. No, that's um, actually not what I want. It's already in the admin. It's about schedule. Well, and technically, we'll technically, it's not after two readings. It's I mean, that's why we're having this vote now, because it's come back to council and we're re referring to committee. But I believe that that's something you can do uh, unilaterally. That's all. Thank you, and we will before the night's over. Um, the motion was and approved to um, extend the time until the report for February 17th, as I understand it. Okay. Thank you. We are now done with second readings. We're moving down to first readings. Um, Let's see. Um, Mr. President, I move that ordinance 2102 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. 
Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that ordinance 2102 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Um, do we take a vote? Uh, can we, can the clerk please call the roll? Let me say that real fast. Yes, Council Member Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Ian Mount Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Volan? Yes. And Scambalori? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and that passes. Eight zero. Would a clerk please rise? Please read. Ordinance twenty one oh two. Getting late. I'm sorry. <laughs> to rezone a ten point oh nine seven acre property from plan unit development to mixed use corridor regarding Bill C. Black. It's contagious. Bill C. Brown, revocable trust petitioner. The synopsis is as follows. Ordinance 2102 rezones 10.097 acres from plan unit development to mixed use corridor. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, actually <laughs> is, I'm sorry, did I hear something? Yeah, Mr. President, I'd yes. like to move that, that ordinance 2102 be adopted. Uh, no. point, point of order. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the appropriate um, motion to consider at this point, sorry, grabbing my charger, uh, would be to uh, refer to a standing committee if anyone yes. would like to make a motion. Councilmember P. Piedmont Smith. I move that Ordinance 2102 be referred to the Land Use Committee. Second. second. Okay, thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Flaherty. Um, I'm sorry, point of order. Uh, actually, I, uh, we need a time uh, for for the meeting uh, for the standing committee as part of the motion. Um, I, unless I missed it, did you say a time, Councilmember Piedmont Smith? Um, no, I did not. Um, and I'd like President. to offer a friendly amendment, if I may, um, 5:30 <laughs> p.m. for the land use committee on February the. Mr. President. Is that acceptable, Councilmember Piedmont Smith? Yes. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Bolton. Uh, just, uh, I, I like a point of clarification here. Uh, I'm, do we need to specify the time now or just the date? I thought that uh, uh, we had given <clears throat> the president the ability to determine the timing of meetings on a given committee night. I'm not so sure about that, and I'm just following what our parliamentary and what we've talked about. So I think I, this is proper. I can add, um, I, I and, and perhaps Mr. Lucas could as well. I believe we did that through a suspension of the rules last year, yes. and I don't believe we've done that this year. So until yes. we pass Ordinance 2103 and give that authority to the president in some way, I believe we need to consider a motion. Oh, that I'm sorry. Time. That's that's we. You're. I, I withdraw my concern. Thank so you. So if, if Councilmember Piedmont Smith would uh, be interested in restating the motion um, uh, with the specified time, I think that would be in order at this time. I move that Ordinance 2102 be referred to the Land Use Committee to meet on February 10th at 5.30 p.m. Second. Second. Okay, it's been properly moved and second. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Councilmember Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. And Sims? Yes. Thank you. And that, and that passes 8-0. Um, and before we move further, and I'll check with the parliamentarian, um, do we need to do anything else other than my referral with regard to a time for the administration committee? 
I don't believe so, okay. unless. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. And we'll take care of that in council schedule. Mr. Council Member Boland. Yes, yes, I have one more question. Um, normally, when items have to do with land use come forward, rezoning, for example, the address of the property in question is stated. Could I ask the clerk if there is an address for the property that is in question in 2102? Not that I can see listed in the um, title, title and synopsis. synopsis. And Does I do not have the legislation in front of me right at this moment to look at it. So you'll have to give me a moment if you'd like me to read it. Uh, I'd be happy to. I just wanted to know if there's anyone who does know what the address is. Uh, so anything we, we can find out. Um, thank you. Mr. Bolin, point of yes. information. Um, the address in the, is 300 South State Road 446, 4500 East 3rd Street, 4506 East 3rd, 4518 East 3rd. Uh-huh. Very good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you very, very much. Um, moving to the next item, we're moving to additional public comment. Um, I will remind everyone that this is a maximum of 25 minutes is set aside for this section. Um, you can contact us by Raise, using the raised hand function in Zoom, or you can contact us through chat. Um, I will also remind you that comments are for items not on today's agenda. And once again, if we do have public comment um, and there is more than one person on the computer or the phone, um, we would respectfully ask that you let us know. Um, Mr. Lucas, do we have any takers? Yes, I received a comment uh, via chat that uh, Carl Swenson asked me to uh, to read. It's a it's a question. Carl says, "I do have one question for the council. How many of the members live in a neighborhood that would be affected by the zoning change that would allow plexes?" And that is Carl's question. Um, I see Nathan. Hey, much thank you would like to comment and should now be able to do so. Well, how, well, before we do that, about how many do you see? I see two hands raised at the moment. I see two. Okay, thank you. Nathan Munchler, you're, if you're ready. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> okay, can you identify yourself and can you identify yourself and you'll have five minutes. My name is, <coughs> excuse me, my name is Nathan Mutchler, um, Bloomington resident. And uh, the first thing I would like to speak on is I am by no means a zoning expert or a housing expert or even lay person on that matter. But thinking back to the earlier public comment and the gentleman who said, um, to the effect of it was inaccurate to call this conversation about race and to look at all the other things. And I've been listening to a lot of public comment about this zoning ordinance and pretty much everyone who's opposed to it has said, they didn't say they're opposed to it. They said, let's, let's talk about it. Let's, let's go back to meetings. Let's put it off down the line. And that raises a red, red flag to me. When someone's afraid to come out and say, I oppose this for reasons, but instead says, I just want to discuss this. I want to keep talking about this. I want us to consider it later. Well, doing nothing is essentially the same thing as saying no, but, uh, but with less courage and clarity. But enough on that. <clears throat> what I would like to do is to take a moment to uh, have us all look around our house for a moment and think, Think about our homes. If your home's anything like mine, there's things you love about it. I really have enjoyed trying to get my garage organized and tidied up. There's things I hate, these crazy light switches that never quite work the way I intended. But it's our home, for better or for worse. So I want you to imagine after this meeting, you've gone to bed, you're sleeping, and suddenly your whole home starts to shake. 
an earthquake, a hurricane, a tornado in the middle of a snowstorm. You don't know what it is, but your home is being torn apart. You run outside and suddenly your home and all your belongings are scattered across your driveway and your front yard. I'd call that an emergency. I think you would too. Well, that's what happened to one of my friends when a snowplow came along and caught his tent and dragged his home into the road and scattered his belongings across the way. You might ask, well, why did this snowplow catch his house? That's because his house was moved from one spot to another because the city, the county, the post office, whoever couldn't get their act together to give this person a place to live. Now we've been asking, well, why doesn't he go to a shelter? Shelters are warm. I think 17 cases of COVID at one shelter answers that. Or maybe we've all had a roommate that we didn't like. At some point, maybe it was college, maybe it was after college, maybe it's a sibling who we're only just now getting along with. Maybe he didn't wanna to go to a shelter because he wanted some privacy. Maybe he had issues where he wasn't allowed at this shelter. And so he chose to sleep where he could, to make his home where he could. And a city snowplow dragged his home into the street. The same way that if a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake came through and dragged any of our homes and tossed them into the street, we would want to make it an emergency. Enough waiting. Use your authority to, to craft legislation to demand that we treat this housing these next six weeks of freezing cold winter as an emergency, the same way we would if any of our homes were in danger. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, who do we have, Mr. Lucas? Next up is Nicole Johnson. Hi, Nicole Johnson. Hi, thank you, you have, so much. You have, five, you have five minutes. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. My name is Nicole Johnson. Um, uh, regarding what was <clears throat> being discussed tonight, um, I would just like to say that it uh, everybody, I mean, I agree that like the near west side would be really sad to lose and all kinds of stuff. Like, I'm not gonna say that I know the answer. Um, I love that neighborhood and it has a historic value and all kinds of everything everybody's heard tonight. Um, so I don't know what the answer is, but I can tell you that putting affordable housing on a back burner is a luxury. Um, and I'm just gonna leave it at that. Anybody who says we can wait for affordable housing isn't taking into account what's happening um, across our nation right now. And that's what I have to say about that. And then also I'd like to just bring some facts together that I've been collecting and present them to y'all. Um, so it's come to our attention that there have been about 17 cases or so um, of COVID that have come out of the Wheeler mission. Um, I believe 10 of those in like the last week or something crazy. Um, also, uh, we know this because people from Wheeler are being refused entry into Shalom. So, so now they can't get services because they're potentially COVID positive. And it's my understanding that if someone's been exposed to COVID that they need to isolate. So if we have a houseless population that roves from Wheeler Mission, Friends Place, the new emergency shelter and Shalom Center, and they're all congregate and uh, I'm gonna say overcrowded uh, as far as, well, not all of them, but like Shalom for sure. Like they, the people come in and out of there, there's a lot. And then they can't do anything about it. They try to do their best, you know, but. Um, it's, there's more people than there is space. Uh, and so everybody's trying to keep everybody warm. Um, the point is, is that 
So now we have four, and, and we already know that Beacon has uh, staff, has, we had outreach out, many outreach staff, and then now a caseworker and her staff are out. Um, and that's rolling inside of Beacon as well. Um, and so we know that the providers that are housing congregate or housing or, or, or hosting and shalom during the day, obviously they're not housing, but um, they have congregate shelter space for our houseless population are experiencing COVID. So that, to me, that, that makes them all eligible for the isolation center. Um, and now with FEMA increasing uh, the uh, reimbursal to 100%, and I believe that's through June of 2021, and um, they have, or no, it might be through September. I might be getting my months mixed up. And then the, uh, but, and then the other part is, is that um, um, they can stay until June. That's what it is. They can stay in the hotels until June, 2021. And the, the funding for the hotels is all the way through, or the funding for CARES, extended CARES is through 2020, uh, September. So this is all guaranteed 100% return and the city has emergency public safety money. They have coffers for rainy days. And this is a really, really, really rainy day. And with that, I yield my time. Thank you for your comments. Do we have anyone else, Mr. Lucas? No, I don't believe so. Okay, give it just a second. Okay, seeing none, I believe we are, oh, I know we're now at council schedule. Does staff have anything to offer or suggestion with regard to our council schedule? Yes, um, I wanted to note that um, at the moment, there are um, no items, uh, that appear to be ready for introduction at the February 17th council meeting. Um, those items would have been previewed at this Friday's work session. Um, and so for this reason, the council may wanna consider a motion to cancel the work session. Um, I will note that there had been um, a few items previewed, I believe at the January 22nd work session that wound up uh, for various reasons being delayed, um, but that those items are still uh, Staff is working, I believe, on those items. Um, uh, but at the moment, there are no new items ready for introduction that haven't already been previewed at a work session. So uh, the council may want to consider canceling uh, the work session for this Friday. Mr. President, I move that we cancel the council work session for February 5th. Second. Thank you. Been properly moved and second. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes. <laughs> um, Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Okay. Um, Rollo? Yes. Volan? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Okay. Uh, it looks like it passed 7 0, unless I'm miscounting. Um, so I would go yes. My apologies. Oh. I lost my internet connection on my other computer, so I had to pop back in. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Um, that motion passed 8 0. Um, so work session for Friday, I believe that's February the 5th at noon has been canceled. Um, what else do we have, Mr. Lucas? No further items for me, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, just do want to remind um, those that are affected for next week, um, committee week, land use committee will meet at 5.30 p.m. and administration committee will meet at 7 p.m. Um, and wanted to make sure that the clerk heard that loud and clear as well. Do we have any other business? This evening? Council Member Scambler. Um, just a point of clarification, following up on Mr. Lucas's comments, are, 
do you recommend that we try to set aside time for a work session on the 12th or are you suggesting we don't need it at all? What are you suggesting we don't need it at all? The next work session after the 5th would be the 19th. That would be the work session associated with items coming forward for in, uh, first reading on March the 3rd. Um, so I'm suggesting that the only items that may be introduced on February the 17th would be items that you've already heard of, heard about at a work Got session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any other business? Do I have a motion to adjourn? So move moved. Adjourn. Second. Okay. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Um, parliamentarian, do we need to take a roll call? Or can I just say good night to my colleagues? I think you're okay. Saying good night. Good night to my colleagues. Thank you all. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.